right, it is just after three o'clock on Tuesday, September 20th, 2022. And we're gonna continue our strategic planning session. And so we're gonna welcome you all once again to help get us started. Perfect. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we're at it again. <laughs> Part three. Um, so because uh, I guess this is televised, we're going to do a quick reboot for anyone that might be uh, watching for the first time with respect to what we're working on. And so if you want to go ahead, Harrison, um, just to refresh, um, this is a strategic planning process. The city has had a strategic plan for many years. Um, so this is not new or unusual. I think what is different this time, and uh, you had engaged ECCOG, the East Central Iowa um, Council of Governments, uh, to really look at expanding your time frame out from a two-year strategic plan to a five-year strategic plan. Um, and with respect to that, we kind of built in some additional components to the plan um, with respect to vision and strategies. And so we've been... Uh, in this process since March, when we started with individual interviews with the council members, we've had a, a couple of more intensive uh, idea generation sessions with both the council and staff. And then starting in August, we gave you a bunch of wonderful action items that we uh, had in a booklet here, and you did some initial prioritization. And now we're coming, uh, we came together on September 8th to kind of try and um, funnel those ideas down even further, um, but didn't quite make it through all of our, our segments. And so we're back together today to hopefully uh, wrap up that portion of the process. And we may, it sounds like need to, um, once we've finished our work today, our goal would be to, to get all of the changes into the plan We'll send it back to staff. There'll be a few things that they will need to put in with respect to more specific timelines and champions. Um, but then to get that plan back out to you so then you can see it sort of all together at once. And it, it may be necessary to come together one more time and just do the kind of final set of refinements to make sure that once you see it in its uh, grand state that uh, it still feels realistic and on track with where you want to be. Um, so for today, quick reboot, we'll dig into economy um, and then safety and well-being. Um, and then start the resources section, uh, which has largely been drafted by staff, um, but we're, they're seeking your input as well into that component of the plan. And then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time to talk about uh, next steps and how you want to track your progress. I show this as... Um, I was thinking that we would wrap up at five, but it seems like we're going to wrap up. Need to wrap up maybe a little bit earlier than that to give you an adequate break before you you start your next section. Would that be accurate? Yeah. It would be appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like you have a busy night ahead of you. Mm -hmm. um, um, so again, this is the strategy map that we've been working off of. The components of the strategy map um, were really components that existed for the most part um, in previous strategic plans. They've just been organized differently. On the left-hand side, we have our values, um, in partnerships and engagement, climate action, racial equity, social justice, and human rights. And these are the values that are really guiding the plan as well as kind of the desired outcomes that you're working towards. Then you have the impact areas, which are represented in that blue box. Um, and that's really how you intend to, the areas in which you intend to impact your community, kind of reflecting the unique mission that the city has. Um, and there we had housing neighbor and neighborhoods, mobility, economy, safety and well-being. And then the last portion kind of at the bottom uh, were the resources needed to execute the strategy. Um, and there you see facilities, equipment and technology, people and financial. And so we had um, we have specific terms that we're using within the plan. We talk about vision, what's that in picture of what we're trying to work towards, and we've already largely made the edits that we wanted to make to the vision for uh, each of the plan components. We had our general strategies of how we wanted to work towards that vision, and then we had the action steps, which is really our was the focus of our work um, during the last session, as well as what we'll do here today, and that's really the to-do list. You know, what are the specific items we want to tackle that we can check off a list, um, 
to help us advance the strategies that are gonna get us to this vision. And we talked about putting our action steps into two phases. Um, phase one would be action steps that we want to be completed this fiscal year or in fiscal year 24 or 25. And then action steps two being um, items that would be completed in fiscal years 26 through 28. We had also, oops, I might just back up for a moment. Um, we had also suggested that you focus, um, with respect to the strategic plan, that you focus the action steps on um, things that are gonna require significant human or financial resources, things that are highly visible or have a high impact, things that might require a large degree of collaboration either within the city itself or between the city and other organizations, or lastly, things that are just gonna take up a lot of council time or community involvement. So in terms of all the ideas we gave you to prioritize, um, we tried to capture it. most of the ideas that were generated during the brainstorm session. And there may be great ideas in there that may end up being executed, but they may not rise to the level that we wanna actually potentially call them out on a strategic plan. Last time we had also talked about this idea of the importance of being realistic, and we did a little brainstorm session around that. And just to remind you again, um, you know, that if, if we're being realistic with our goals, um, in your own words, that had the potential for a lot of positive outcomes in terms of motivation, creating trust between the council and, and local government and the public and building momentum and people feeling heard. On the converse side, if you're setting unrealistic goals and you're not able to meet most of those, um, most of those goals that have been set, it can be demoralizing, uh, certainly maybe demoralizing for staff. And, um, it might perpetuate government stereotypes and so on and so forth. All right, are you ready to dig in? <laughs> okay. Um, so we are starting on page 20 today, which was the economy section. And I did pass out, um, so you should have near you, the results of the further prioritization that you had forwarded to us that we're gonna use to guide our conversation today. And the good news is with respect to economy, it, um, it seemed like there was a, some consensus with respect to um, some items that really stood out to you and um, in terms of being significant amongst a list of a lot of great ideas. And so Harrison, I might have you bring up the other sheet at this point. So we're gonna bring up that workbook page again. Uh, no, the one that where we actually put it in phase one or phase two. Oh, here. Um, so we're gonna start to go through these similar to what we did last time, um, perhaps starting with item number 17. Um, and then I'm looking for the council agreement on whether or not you think this should be in the plan, and then also whether or not you're thinking it's a phase one or phase two. And as we work through this list, you'll notice when we get to the bottom, there were some items that were only mentioned by one council member as, as um, being super high priority. And I guess I'll leave it up to you whether or not you wanna dig into those items or not based on what's already been identified. And so with that, uh, item number 17 was um, enhance access to affordable childcare for all populations through innovative partnerships. So I'm, so I'm seeing heads nodding. So mm -hmm. I think this Looks is like there was a consensus on important. that one. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, phase one? Yeah, definitely. Yes. Okay. All right. Can I grab like a minute or two of everybody's time and sort of give you give you a brief sketch of, of some of the things that at least I've been thinking about and shared with with um, Mayor Pro Tem Alter about the bigger vision for this. Um, so I'll try and make it as brief as possible. I know the city's already doing a little bit of this, some of this with with the county, um, and the, the, and we've talked about that before. So. It has to do with the combination of affordability um, and getting everybody the services that they need and paying people what they deserve so that you can have actual qualified childcare personnel who then will stay in their jobs and have a career prospect. Uh, and the, very, the various elements that, that I see are one, um, creating a fund, which I think is already partly underway, to 
um, to help subsidize wages um, for for childcare workers to bring them up to a, a, a place where um, it's not, they're not in competition with fast food or something else, where it's a, dec a decent wage, hopefully at some point with, with benefits. Um, and uh, and you can, we could start that with, with ARPA funds, for example. Um, my, my, if we ever get there, my vision would be to switch that and some of these other things into LOST and use and pass LOST together with the county to be able to fund that as well as some other things. Um, the other things that I, I think that I would think need to be funded is uh, the gap between what people get in child care assistance and what child care actually costs so that everybody can have access to quality child care. Um, and as well as working with the school district to expand their current pilot program, which is which has this pre-K with wraparound care in four different schools, um, with people who can can afford it, paying for the wraparound care, which is actually quite reasonable, and those who can't afford it are on free or reduced lunch, getting getting uh, just getting the child care that the child care portion comp that allows everybody who wants to have their kids attend pre-K be able to attend pre-K because they, they don't have to transfer them like twice a day while they're at work. It allows everybody, all the kids to start at an even K through 12 at a much more even scale pl place so that um, they have much, there's a much better chance of, of equity in education going forward. Um, and so that's sort of the, that those are sort of the pieces that I would love to see us think as we go forward that could be funded first by ARPA and then I, I would hope by, by LOST, working together with the school district and the county so that we can really serve all the kids in, in the area. Okay, we're ready to move on to the next item. Um, and that was number 19 which is uh, partnering with the Iowa City Community School District, Iowa Labor Center, local trades, and other stakeholders to provide meaningful career development opportunities, pre-apprenticeship programs, et cetera. So consensus that should be on the, in the plan, uh, phase one or phase two? Phase one. Phase one, no, I think phase one. we're phase one. doing it. Okay. Right. I think we have it in our right. packet. But at least part of it. Yes. I wondered about um, number 16, which is relating to Kirkwood and adult education. I don't know if that's combining those is too big of a scope, but I just see sort of a continuum there that Kirkwood could be sort of one of the other stakeholders, but I don't know if folks agree with that or not. Well, and to the extent actually that Kirkwood is also working to help with a training program for child care workers exactly. that, yeah. um, so there's a partnership and that's Already. about to launch. Right, fact. that's part of their regional center. With the, uh, right, the, the. And, and there is a very specific plan. So I think that, to your point, yes, I think that we could productively and without, well, I say without adding a whole lot of work, but it seems like Kirkwood should be a partner because there's a lot of overlap in terms of what they're doing to help with goals that we haven't place or that we're discussing. I would agree. <laughs> so we'll maybe tweak that language um, so that it encompasses 19 and 16. Mm -hmm. All right, then we had number 12, um, which is using ARPA funds to execute on agreeable recommendations in the inclusive economic development plan. I know this is one that, that I put on there because it seems to reflect something we're sort of, I mean, we're already sort of working in some of these areas with the ARPA funds, so this seemed like a phase one because we're in that window of using these. So that that's why I included it in, in, in mine. So. so I see a lot of head nodding. <coughs> yeah, um, great. There seems to be general consensus that that would also be phase one. Mm -hmm. And then we had number 13, which was increasing small business technical assistance. I 
I'm happy to see that as a priority because I think small business owners and the technical assistance is so critical mm -hmm. um, for their success. So I, I think it's a good thing that it is here. And of course, we'll have to have partners to kind of help us achieve some of these things. But I'm happy it, it rose to the top of the list. I didn't have it on mine, but I'm happy to put it on there and to throw in my lot with saying, yes, this should be a priority because it is something that is so concrete that can help a lot of people that I know is a, you know, it's a frustration and it's a time suck and it can take money. And so mm -hmm. I certainly um, do not have a problem with that if others are ready to prioritize it. Yeah, I, I think anytime we can encourage locally grown and local businesses, it, it's vitally important. It may also be something that some that someone like Merge can help with, or an organization like Merge can help with as an incubator, as well as Tracy John's project. Any thoughts on whether that should be a phase one or phase two? So I have a question, I guess, for, for Jeff and staff. I mean, what would that, what is that load looking like since we have a couple of big projects already ahead, <clears throat> excuse me, and I know all of this, the work behind the scenes is more of a lift than a one-liner. So what, uh, does that seem feasible to, I mean, we have a lot of relationships. Is it possible to work through this without too much blood, sweat, and tears from staff or? Yeah, um, I think when I look at all th three and I guess four items with this one, um, I think we can make a lot of progress in those first three years, but I don't know that you're done with them in those right. in that phase two. So, the technical assistance, I think that's probably something you'll you'll hear a little bit about tonight with the inclusive economic development plan. So that's one area. Maybe we start with that effort, and then it maybe it grows beyond uh, that in the in the out years. So I, I don't have a problem putting these all in phase one, as long as the expectations are clear that. It's, it's probably a five year and beyond type of effort. And my sense is that most of these are ongoing. <laughs> I mean, we're sort of, so we have this somewhat artificial division, but it's not gonna end. So I, I think I you can put them in phase one. Phase one, okay. All right, and then number two was about uh, flexible incentives to support um, Schmids. I mean, I think that it's kind of, all these are ongoing mm -hmm. sort of things. Uh, working with, the, with our Schmids is one example of that. And so, I mean, it, you don't wanna, say do everything in phase one, but some of these are already something I think we're engaged in. And so I don't know if it makes sense to put it in a phase two or uh, I'm not sure what. Well, this, so uh, when I read this, uh, you're not only talking about the Schmids, but other commercial nodes. Um, and uh, you're, we're talking incentives. So in my mind, that's largely financial incentives. Sure, there, there could be some, some land use incentives considered as well. Right now, we don't have very flexible incentives, right? We, we, if we rely on TIF, that's a very regimented type of process that we, we put somebody through. If you increase flexibility, we're doing uh, probably more grant programs, more one-off types of incentives. We may be working with a Schmid on business recruitment or you know, whatever, uh, whatever um, item they may be working on. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's changing the way we look at economic development incentives a little bit in my mind. And I don't know what that looks like yet, but uh, um, <coughs> flexible is the key word there for me. I think based on that, that feels more like a longer term, at least maybe other people are hearing it differently, but that makes it okay. make some more sense as phase two to me. I'm, I'm seeing it as also something of a grassroots, you know, it's coming from the SMIDs who are coming from the neighborhood commercial nodes that we, we might hear from them, you know, in terms of how can the city help? You know, we, we, we're envisioning this. How can we partner with you? Um, I, I mean, I think it's something that could happen and, you know, it it's, would be more on a merging level perhaps than 
something that we're sort of establishing as our own goal to me. But it could be long term if we want to keep it in there. What strikes me is what you said, Jeff, that it was, it's kind of re-envisioning. I mean, it's, it's a shift in, in economic development. So I see that as sort of what are they going to come to us with so that it's not all generating from us. And I do see that as kind of longer term because certainly downtown district, that's an ongoing thing. They've had some asks for some flexibility and you know it's ongoing as a relationship. But then with the South District now becoming you know, getting all the T's and I's, they will also come up with things. So I just, I see this as more of a longer term without precluding, like, things may come up in the interim, but as far as a real strategic move, I can see it as. We wouldn't walk away from an opportunity because we had it out at four years instead of two years. Right, yeah. exactly. I mean, we play it as it comes, but I can see this more as on our map as saying maybe a couple of years from now, we're going to have a better sense of what those incentives might look at, and we might be able to formalize them or or offer them as, for instances, that type of thing. So anyway, long-winded way to say phase two works for me. Is there um, some natural overlap between some of what we're talking about with that and uh, item number one? So that targeted marketing um, is a unique and attractive place to do business. Is that item? Because I don't, you probably like me don't have these memorized. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but just in terms of some of that flexible thing and, you know, having that targeted marketing, I mean, that would be, you know, if we were doing number one, we would probably be working with our SMIDs with that. I mean, I can't imagine we wouldn't have them as part of that discussion, although we right, have other groups too. Right, I mean, I'm, and I'm pretty sure that the, at least the downtown district already does its own, a lot of it, some of its, a, a chunk of its own targeted marketing. I had, I had selected number one because I thought it was more inclusive. Um, it would include, as you just mentioned, number two. Mm -hmm. It was a broader, con it was a more broader that brought in several um, of these points. And so um, I would agree that number one is kind of, it can go into number two. I agree. I'd, I'd, I'd put it on my list um, as important, too, because we've been hearing for many years now, you know, what is Iowa City doing about attracting businesses to the community? So I think that it's very important to the community for them to see that, that it, it is a priority for us, And uh, but I could see us phasing into it and into the second would be fine. But I think it is important. So... Um I'm hearing for number two, phase two. Yeah. And for number one, you're thinking that could be combined with number two? Certainly would overlap. I don't know if they have to be try and cram it all into one bullet point. Or maybe, I mean, but there is going to be some natural like synergy there, sure. right? And yeah, so sure. um, but that could also be, they could both be phase two with the idea that uh, what uh, Councillor Thomas had said about you know, we also want to make sure that we are letting ideas percolate up rather than us, you know, and that needs some time to breathe. So, I mean, to me, that makes a phase two goal, but if things come faster, then great. That's my thought. So they're complementary in phase two. They're kind of complementary. I think so. Mm -hmm. And that's the consensus generally of the, the group, okay. All right, so now we're into the ones that just had, were forwarded by one individual. Um, starting with 23. Oh, that was mine. Um, and I don't feel like I need to strong arm anyone just so long as I think that it, I feel fairly confident there's already some really good work in thinking about what is the long-term vision for um, you know, the riverfront. Um, we were told to look for an outlier, and to me that seemed really interesting and as a way that could truly, it could entice you know, different business. It certainly could generate some economic development. Um, I definitely see that as like a phase two um, with an eye on, you know, if things become available to continue, um, you know, 
being able to have kind of a, a longer term vision and not have it all kind of chopped up with individual owners and whatnot. But I don't know what others think. I think 23 and 24 become much more important if we get that grant that we just mm -hmm. applied for with the city of Coralville and Johnson County. Um, I don't know that I'd be willing to, you know, sort of shift significant funding as would be necessary for this kind of thing. But certainly if, you know, that vision was very inspiring and I think the regional collaboration of it makes it a lot more um, exciting and important. I think for 23 and number 18, I feel like it was is already in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I didn't give it yep. any <laughs> energy thinking that I right, can right. promote some other things that weren't. I think it's more just I was like kind of calling it out. <laughs> um, so I don't have I, a problem. If I can interject, the, the one thing I would say is um, just because something's in the pipeline now, you know, the pipeline's got so much capacity in it when you're introducing two or three other items, Might get something squished gets out. squeezed out. And if, if it's not a stated priority in here, um, yes, we're, gonna con we're always gonna continue to try to chip away at, at our riverfront and make you know, better public spaces and trails and whatnot. But uh, if that's something that, that you absolutely wanna see happen in these five years, you've, that's a big commitment to make. Um, that's in the Better Together plan. That's not our plan, but um, it's been w recognized by the region as an important uh, strategy uh, for the larger area. Um, I'm not saying it needs to be on here or it doesn't, but there is meaning to having it on here. And that goes with any item. When you're putting that at the top, or, or one of the four, five, six things that make a list, your staff's gonna focus on that. And especially come budget time, we're gonna prioritize projects that get us closer to that goal. So there is a shifting of resources um, that, that happens. Well, I, I certainly, um, you know, I've, looked, I've, I've been advocating for a stronger river scape for a long time. Um, I had a more modest, humble notion of it, <laughs> I think it was. Um, perhaps, you know, something that could be done incrementally, not necessarily in one, as one major project. Uh, the notion of a river walk always, has always appealed to me, which means that that walk needs to be comfortable, interesting, and so forth. But we could, we could implement that um, incrementally, perhaps using the, some grant funds to do it as well. Uh, I feel Riverfront Crossings Park really needs tree canopy, serious tree canopy and uh, uh, some additional seating. I mean, if so, so some of these things are kind of, we have existing facilities, but perhaps they need to be improved upon. So I, th I think there needs to be some emphasis. I'm not a big, I'm not an advocate for spending massive amounts of dollars on, on the river improving the river, uh, but at the same time, I think some work needs to be done there. So if, if perhaps if it's in the strategic plan as a, and I think I'm a little bit frustrated with the phase one, phase two, I kind of just see this as something that is in the plan um, and we need to take advantage of opportunities as they arise. But um, I, it is, I think it is a good point of emphasis. We have a lot of valuable amenities along the river the art museum is now another. Mm -hmm. And I, what I have always felt is they don't link up to one another. It would be interesting to try to create kind of a necklace of amenities which integrate through a river walk, you know, a corridor experience that, that people would experience all the way from Hancher down to Riverfront Crossings Park. Um, so, yeah, I would say let's have it in there, but I, you know, I don't think it needs, and then just see how it how it moves forward. So maybe add 23 to phase two? Okay with that. Or does it make sense? I don't mean to draw this out, but, and I, I actually would love to have it on phase two. I am the one that put it out there and I'm taking my cue from the way that Jeff described this of like, if we want some, to do this, then we need to make sure it's on there. That said, there are several other that are one-offs and maybe does it make sense, it, I'm gonna put myself into your shoes and say, is it a, too complicated if we were to actually briefly just walk through what the other ones were to see, rather than go through the list and be like, yep, that needs to go on there? Or 
Um, I think uh, is that is the most efficient way the way that we've been doing it. I don't want to add more time to or to take over your facilitation. Um, I'm open to ideas. I don't know that there's a right or a wrong way. Um, I think I know uh, we've already dealt with 16, so there was just number 18 and number 11 uh, left on this list. I think given the, the grant application, it makes sense to put it into phase two and, and see what see what happens because mm -hmm. then if we get the grant, you start working on that. Maybe you can sort of do a, a few right. um, things absent the grant, but I mean, I take Jeff's point that if it's, some, if it's something we want for the future, we ought to have it in there somewhere. Why don't we put it on phase two? It sounds yeah. like there's a pretty good consensus there. Yeah. Um, and so then that brings us to 18, which seems to tie back a little bit to 17. But, but which is already, I think it's already in train. That's what I think the mayor said. He hadn't put it on his list because it's already in train. We're yeah, I, I think I had that on my, my list. And, and I think it's more, I think I, I added it in there um, because I do I do want to place an emphasis in our strategic plan on the um, improving the, the life of our, our young people, and uh, in that regard, you know I I'm in, interested in seeing the final product of this thing and uh, if that's if that's in here in some fashion um, because you know Jeff had mentioned you know, before we started this exercise, if we had any uh, thoughts regarding our budget. And I, I'm beginning to see that there may be things that we have we have in here that may have been some way or another dropped out. And we, we may want to consider them to be a budget item. It's not necessarily a strategic plan item, but it is something um, that that might provide an opportunity for being a project uh, within the budget. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm fine with not having it in the strategic plan. So 18, no? I'm okay with not having it. Um, and then number 11 was the last one. Right, I think that was me. <clears throat> I stuck number 11 in because when you look at some of the empty spaces downtown and some of the think places that we have a really hard time filling, not just downtown, some other places too. There have been some at Pepperwood Plaza as well. but. I, I, right now, I'm <clears throat> I'm mindful of the downtown with places like Active Endeavors that are really big places, um, and the and the U.S. Bank building, which is still sitting there, uh, and the, and us wanting to support, uh, and there are just spaces that probably that no single business is going to take on on their on their own at this point. If we want to have a, a a vibrant downtown that really um, attracts businesses and not just and not chains and so forth and not just I mean, I love the restaurants and bars, but we want to mix. We want to mix as well, um, and we're trying to support um, smaller businesses, BIPOC businesses, and others. I, I have no, I have no <laughs> claim to a vision at all as to how this would be done, or who would do it, or who would fund it. But we have these spaces that are empty because they're too big. Um, and if there were some way to, to sort of invest in, in splitting them up, then, then we might actually get takers and more um, places where a lot of these small businesses could find a home. So, but I, ha I don't have, I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on that, Jeff, but I have no clue how that would happen. Well, they're, they're largely vacant and underused because there's a, an economic issue, right? The private market can't afford to retrofit those and then you know, make the numbers work. So. This item's largely targeted financial incentives to underutilized properties. And um, that can be really exciting, uh, but it takes a partner as well. You have to have a property owner that, that also wants to invest with you. Um, so yeah, as long as you understand this is probably more of a financial item than, than anything else. Uh, could, be, could be land use. I mean, there could be some land use changes that might incentivize um, turnover of those properties, but but I would say largely financial. So yeah, I don't feel strongly one way or the other about putting it in, but that's why I flagged it um, for discussion. Well, we included number two, right? I guess that's longer term, but I, it seems to me that 
our commercial nodes might put forth the idea of how do we retrofit, you know, how do we make sure vacant spaces are being used. So I think we could, I think it would be captured likely in, you know, the sort of what we're imagining in number two. Good point. I think it also goes <clears throat> goes along with number one, what we, we discussed. I mean, we've got a we got to market Iowa City as a place to, to have your business, too, to grow and, and develop your business. So it, it really goes along with number one also. So I, I think I hear um, it'll be addressed in it'll be addressed somehow, potentially naturally right, as those folded in or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So maybe not including that in number two which also was included with the number one, so. All right, so that was our list then for economy. <coughs> so I think we're ready to transition it to uh, safety and well-being. Seems like there was a fair amount of consensus around number eight, which is the Integration of community mobile crisis into 911 dispatch protocols. So is that a phase one or? Is that I think so. In process? And I think uh, to my comment, and there's a little asterisk there. Thank you for including that, by the way. Um, just as I was looking at these, and because I had to pick, uh, you know, our, our task was to try and focus in on a limited number, um, just to get us moving. <laughs> um, so I cheated. Uh, because I think that these three, they all involve community um, mobile crisis in some way or another, you know, in part or whatever. So they seem very complementary. Um, and, you know, we probably would, you know, promoting 988, you know, we probably do a lot of these things together anyway, right? I mean, that's kind of my thought process. Um, eight, five, and three sort of just, yeah. they seem to be very related to each other. I don't know if what the best way to approach it. Maybe it makes sense to have them out as, separate things so we can check those boxes. But in terms of having to pick four, I, I cheated, so. Yeah, it's like, <clears throat> eight, I can see putting five and three together. Eight seems to me something of a standalone simply because of all the different communities um, and organizations that have to be, that have to agree and have to work together um, in order to make that happen, in order to um, agree the, all, the, all the folks who make up the, the Johnson County Emergency mm -hmm. Group. And then you, have to, then you have to have the training and you have to have, we have to be, you have to be at a point where um, there's sufficient um, understanding that the community mobile, mobile crisis is, is um, in a good position to go on calls by themselves without it, without it, without being in danger. So that sort of all there's there's a ton of boxes to check. So, I mean, I see I also see it as phase one, but it's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. I think I didn't pick number eight um, as a priority because it it seemed as though we're kind of already doing that. We're already in that phase and and. Um, Utilizing the community mobile crisis with 911 calls and delineating which are appropriate for the community crisis versus the law enforcement. So I hadn't I hadn't listed that because I kind of thought we were already. Yeah, it's not it's not it's hap it's, it's I mean it's not happening yet through our 911 operators, right. and that's going to happen. That's a like a much bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. Number three, where it says with the goal of tripling current mm -hmm. coverage in the five-year period. So Iowa City area is covered. So I, I'm not exactly sure if that was like expanding. So th this is the mental health liaison position, which is the position that's embedded in our police department. And right now we have one individual uh, working approximately 40 hours a week. Uh, obviously police is 24 seven uh, and the mental health calls come in at all times of day. Uh, so we've certainly found that resource to be beneficial and it's something that, that we would like to work towards as staff, but that would be hiring more liaisons so you have somebody day, night, evening shifts, and then eventually enough to, to cover 24 seven. Okay. I read, I, when I read this, I just saw the word program. I didn't see Iowa City. Um, so I thought it was expanding this across the Gotcha. The county, and I thought, well, that doesn't involve us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It already says five-year uh, period, so it feels like a f natural phase two because it's an ongoing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so, Jeff, are you? Would you say these are three distinct items? Um, I, I think you could. 
I think three is distinct because it involves our operations. Um, uh, eight um, and, and five, you could, you could combine. It just depends on how broad you want to be, right? If we just want to support mobile crisis and, and civilianized response in general, you can lump them all three together. Um, but they all would have very distinctly different action plans and, mm -hmm. and be worked on by different people, um, both internal and external. So as we get into the planning phase, your staff's probably going to break them out. If you'd like to combine them here, that's, that's fine too. And again, I'm not really saying with a final version, like this may have just been me trying to like think all three of these. And, and I think the, uh, the, the phrase that Jeff just used, civilian response or whatever that, that phrase was, I think that, that kind of was exactly what the thread that I saw through the, all three of them. But, but yes, actioning them out individually, I mean, that's, I have no problem with that if the rest of the council thinks that makes sense. That sounds great to me. I think it's nice to be able to show the progress, you know, right. with distinct, with right. distinct and, steps. And, and also have some um, reiteration that this is a priority, this is a priority, this is a priority, and we're okay. looking at it in different, and we're looking at it in different ways. Well, and it, it creates clarity, too, about what each piece is. So if we were to back up to number eight, um, and I, I guess I'm unclear if this is in process or not in process. Uh, it, it's it's being discussed. discussed. Um, I don't think it's um, very far into an implementation phase, but it's being discussed. So, so uh, eight, eight could be a tier one. Um, we're already doing five a little bit, um, both promotions and financially supporting. And then three, again, we already started that program. They, they could all be tier one. Um, if you want to put something in year two, it's probably the mental health liaison. That's probably more of a longer term goal. We might make it halfway there in the first tier and finish it out in the second tier. Well, while we're on the theme of kind of civilianizing response and, and that, that kind of thing, Sean and I both had 28 in there, uh, which I call fun patrol just because it makes you all laugh. Um, <laughs> but community, social, and recreational sort of mobile outreach, this could be primarily directed through like the rec department, and we have some of those resources already. But imagining something that could be more consistently going out into the neighborhoods, checking on people, you know, providing different levels of engagement and interaction, not just like show up at the park at this one time um, kind of thing. But I think there's a continuum of interventions that, you know, very broadly could be classified as response that that would fall into as well. Well, and I think combining those three, uh, you know, was sort of my way to include something like this that is more, <coughs> Um, proactive community building because part of our goal in this, and, and it's mentioned in a couple of different ways, um, is this idea of resiliency and community resiliency, whether it's in terms of fighting you know, the effects of global climate change or whatever that might be, so that you know the healthy atmosphere, healthy neighborhoods, and Councillor Thomas talks about this way more eloquently than I do, um, this concept of, of, so it just seems like a way the city could actively engage that. So that's, that's also why I kind of threw that in there, because it is a little bit different from the other ones. It kind of stood out to me, but in, in a very positive sort of way, so. Number 28, you're? 28, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think uh, if you, if, when I look at 28, which is more, is kind of a programming approach, mm -hmm. if we were to combine that with what some of the things I'd been advocating, which was, uh, places within the neighborhoods, the 15-minute city, so you have access to places in which these kinds of programs would then flourish. Uh, that, that to me, is sort of a comprehensive view on how we try to make life more interesting and fun for the kids in their own neighborhood. That is their world. You know, the kids primarily live in a very, they, they live in COVID all the time. <laughs> Right, I mean, they don't, they don't have, unless their parents are willing to drive them out of the neighborhood, um, many kids are really, the, the neighborhood is their world. So how can we make that world more interesting and, and fun? So I wanna back up for just a minute and make sure that we're kind of disposing of these uh, correctly. Yeah. So I'm, if the, the city uh, manager was suggesting that 
potentially we put eight, five in phase one and three in phase two. Is there consensus on that, that we can go ahead and drop that in? Okay. Although I do like the idea of expanding the, you know, the way Jeff described it, of going to kind of a 24 hour service, if I understood on number three, Right, and I, I would hope that we would get there sooner rather than no, later. I was going to say, doesn't I, mean, I'd like doesn't mean we I can't get there. I think you were suggesting it move forward now. It yes. may take longer than three years, but I'd like to see it yeah, again I think if now. three could be in number one. Yeah, uh, it, it, it could. I'm, I'm, uh, so we have the one position that's funded now. We have a second position uh, in the budget this current fiscal year um, that we hope to work with community on. The third one, um, I guess I was thinking would, would maybe be a little further out, and, but um, we, could, we could try to bump that up. Um, it's one of those programs that because it's so new, we just want to slowly work it in. Um, uh, but if you want to put it in one and just know that that last step may occur in four and five, that, that's okay too. That's fine. I mean, I, that would be fine with me anyway. But and I would also love, for, ultimately, for the goal of that one to really be to have the the funding flow to community and that it's, it's their person and and eventually, you know, sort of that they expand the capacity of the the, the knowledge and the, the of their capacity to be able to go out on calls on their own. I agree, and I think it really goes with number eight, which is as the 911 dispatch is going to include mobile crisis, starting with that co-response so that everyone in the system kind of learns what that can look like will probably take a few years and be you know, a transition, but I think ramping up the availability of the liaison will directly facilitate that. All right, so uh, why don't we move on to number 12, which was leveraging uh, ARP funds to build capacity for nonprofits. That's not, is that a phase one because it involves ARP funds, ARPA funds? I mean, I think we definitely saw during COVID the, the need for this. Well, um, we just did a what, 400,000 is our? Yeah, that'll come back to you at your next meeting probably. And then we have the larger capital grant program. Uh, so Perfect. the first one will be less about building capacity, more operational, expanding programs. The second one is more capacity building. So like basically putting the current vision into the strategic plan. Right. So phase one? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Number 16 was the neighborhood nests or micro hubs. I had this as important because I was thinking, and it kind of, kind of goes along with my rationale for number 30, which was the senior center, is the community includes people of all ages and, and the safety and well-being is, is all members of the community, no matter what their age. And, and I think the, the hubs that had been started and the nests that were started, uh, we got a lot of positive response on that. And I think it's, it's, it's really important, especially for the teenage kids. I, I put this just because I knew, um, albeit in a limited fashion, that these were really successful. And in many ways, it overlaps or complements for sure the Fun Patrol. I mean, nests during COVID were used initially and perhaps primarily um, as sort of a, a resource for the school district so that kids could have the, the kind of resources, technological, physical, and whatever, to be able to learn. But we've quickly learned after that that it was so much more about being able to be together and that it is a social thing as well. It was incredibly useful for families. So there's, and they can be tailored to what the neighborhood is and what the neighborhood needs are. Um, and I just think that it could be a really cool model moving forward um, outside of, even though we are sitting here masked, um, but outside of a COVID paradigm, but to really think of it as like, uh, how are there ways to bolster um, people in the neighborhoods? And to that point, um, this could be something that it's not limited necessarily to teens. I mean, there's, 
a nest could be a cohort. If there are people who are seniors near and want to get together, that it'd be difficult to perhaps get all the way downtown to the senior center and whatnot. Anyway, that's that's my plug for it. Um, it it is kind of a big lift. I will say that. Um, because you have to find space and partners who are willing to do that and to be there to staff and whatnot. So just kind of fair warning, but it is, so my sense is that if we wanted to put this on, it would be a phase two, um, just because it is, it's a pretty big lift and you need a lot of collaboration. On the flip side, that's precisely what we were told maybe to, to focus on, big bang for the buck and big collaborations. So does uh, 16 and 28 somewhat commingled together? Yeah, I mean, I think 16 is like physical spaces and 28 is more. It's, it speaks again to what, around, what I was but, emphasizing mm -hmm. or trying to stress was great to have the programming and then where will the programming take place? And so they, you know, I, and frankly, I'm not that familiar with the neighborhood nest concept, but I, I, I grabbed onto it because, you know, it, I, I like the, the feel of what it's being described. Um, but, I, you know, so that would be I think in it's phase important two. one way or another that we try to identify a way of, so, with our strategic plan of promoting and developing program as well as locations, places where that program can be implemented. Well, and it fits really well, actually, in terms of one of the things that Parks and Rec, I know that I heard from survey and whatnot, the pool notwithstanding, um, but about going out into the neighborhoods. And so this might be a way to, to kind of solve for both if they were combined. So it would be the programming from Fund Patrol along with trying to find partners in specific locations in neighborhoods, perhaps. So I was going to suggest maybe the, the wording gets tweaked so there's just more flexibility in how it's approached, mm -hmm. but the end goal is to meet people where they are yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and to provide this connection. Um, but I'm hearing phase two. Yeah. So maybe we combine 16 and 28 in, as a phase two item. All right, number two uh, had to do with working with Johnson County to launch a community violence intervention effort. Yeah, I think that's underway and, um, and given, you know, um, I guess the increased um, violence on some level over the past couple of years that we've experienced, I think, uh, that partnership and collaboration is pretty important. I know the, <clears throat> I know the county um, put some ARPA funds into it and uh, has to sort of jump to sort of jump start it. Uh, as <laughs> Over a million dollars. Yeah, I'm I'm um, I'm in favor of it. And so, and I guess I would put it as if we agree to it, I guess I'd put it as phase one since it's already started and it's, and it's trying to get off the ground. Have you participated in any, Mayor? I haven't received an, I haven't received a note of when their meetings are, but they're aware. Yeah, they haven't had a meeting since you were appointed. <coughs> yep, so phase one. I think so. Phase one. Um, number seven was um, considering options such as mailed letters as alternatives to routine non-emergent traffic stops. Yeah, I, I had that in there and I, it reminded me of, I mean, that, that was something that had been brought up some while ago and didn't move forward. But, um, you know, and I, it reminded me also that when I was in our previous discussions under mobility, that part of my concern with you know, the safe streets had to do with trying to promote what I refer to as self-regulating streets so they wouldn't require policing at the same level. So I'm, I, I'm happy to see this in here, actually. I mean, it, we, we went through Black Lives Matter. Policing was really the issue uh, associated with that whole experience that we went through. So I think it's important to have something like this, hopefully some of the issues I had addressed on street safety as it pertains to um, roadway design 
will will work its way in here, whether in the strategic plan or in the budget. But uh, the whole thrust of you know was that I learned from that whole experience was how can we reduce contact? You know, either through finding the better professional to deal with certain types of calls for service, or another way of issuing, in this case. Um, uh, something related to traffic law enforcement through some other means other than the traffic stop, which we know can blow up in very bad ways. So for both the, the driver and the police officer. So I, yeah, I think that's, I'm, and I, I don't know if that came from staff or from. Uh, I, don't know, I think we talked about it at the, <clears throat> at the, at the original. Yeah, anyway, um, I'm supportive of it and I'm happy that it made its way onto the list. So I, I think of cameras, you know, uh, speeding cameras to kind of meet this need. Um, or um, cameras or, are different. Uh, you know, that we a previous council uh, banned them. We would yeah, because this would. I, I don't think this would be what we want, because any well cameras. Oh yeah. Because everybody would get them, and there could be. Um, yeah, okay, so I don't know what other options there would be outside of. I think, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I think in our original discussion, and John and I have talked about this, is, is more like the tail light kind of things. Like uh, we got so much discussion with the Black Lives Matter too that um, perhaps someone was stopped um, and the excuse was that the, your tail light's out, uh, but then they warranted a search of the vehicle. And I think we were thinking um, if it's just, a ta I know it, I shouldn't say just a tail light because that's important to, to maintain your, your car, uh, but we'd, we'd also talked about even having the law enforcement have some kind of a, a tail light day where people could come and, and we'd provide the bulbs uh, free of charge and, and maybe these letters could say, hey, on such and such, we noticed that uh, your light's out and on such and such a day, we're going to help you replace it. You know, I think that's kind of what we're thinking versus speeding and those kind, I don't know, John, you can so correct I, me on that, but we have I, the I don't know that we. I don't know that we should get in the weeds, but I might ask our city attorney to just file in because the state came after we uh, did that in 2020. Oh, I'm sorry, and I, I so got lost. We, for <laughs> yeah, so in 2020, we ha secondary stops, we kind of said no to, and the state came back and said. The state came back and said that there can be no policy that dictates right. to police officers that they shall not enforce the law. Uh, I think that our uh, response to that has been largely, look, I mean, as it has always been the case, you know, there are higher priorities and lower priorities, and I think that's how that's mostly been governed and dictated by officers. So if you, if you move forward, what I might suggest is um, you back off of the specific mailed letters, because that's a pass-fail type of situation, and I don't know that we know that that's r really doable at this time, but alternative uh, enforcements are um, alternative to traditional enforcement, um, special events, expansion of the bulbs program, like something we can work on wording that would be a little bit more all-encompassing, um, understanding what your goal is here. I think that's fine, personally. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. I can support that. Uh, was it, was, do you see that as a phase one or phase two? I, personally, a phase one. Um, it'd be nice to see some, again, movement on this question of trying to reduce, find alternatives to um, police initiating calls for service. And I might just remind council that we're at right at four o'clock, so. Is there agreement then on phase one? I'm okay, yeah. Okay, so number seven, we'd reword and then <laughs> put under phase <clears throat> Okay, so the remaining items um, just had one person advance. So I guess I'll leave it up to you if you want to go through those individually or if you want to pull out a few for discussion. I thought um, uh, number six was something that contain some things that might be 
<laughs> phase one doable and phase two doable. It's kind of, and so in terms of like our public safety applicant pools are diverse through new approaches to recruitment and testing as well as consideration of expanded residency allowances. So it seems like the easier lift of those two, and I can certainly be corrected if I'm wrong, would be looking at some of the expanded residency, you know, uh, footprints, and that's something that I've, I've heard about even before I was, uh, you know, while I was running. Um, but also then, then looking at some of these other issues might take a, take a little more time, but I think that diversity in our hiring pool um, and trying to do what we can at the policy or the city council level to, you know, help with that process. Uh, so some version of that seems like, that's one of the reasons why I, I try to keep that somewhere in my, my stuff. Uh, 20 and 26, honestly, they kind of nestle great with 28 and 16. <laughs> Uh, which is that um, kind of the mobile community social and uh, recreational resources and NAS program. So I, I won't even bring it up at this point for a great for more discussion. I'll just quick speak to number 14. Probably have a little bias on this, and I see Tracy's in the audience here, and I think she was a uh, really spearheaded this program in relationship with the College of Nursing, and and it was a very successful program. And I would hope that it would be phase one that we can continue with this because it really targets uh, the low income and marginalized populations, uh, many of whom you know they don't know what their resources are, or they really don't have any knowledge that this mold in their bathroom is causing flare-ups in their asthma, and, and these um, folks from the College of Nursing did the education on that and was very helpful. And I, I think it's it's very, very important. And I would I would hope we could do phase one and continue with that. I mean, I can support it being in phase one. I can also support what you were talking about, Sean, that's sort of yeah. the, the continue. Because I know, Jeff, that, that we've made, that you've made, we've made substantial efforts to increase applicant pools, to, yeah. to look to look for more diverse applicant pools, to consider you know offering some some um, sort of um, an educational period first, so that somebody could pass a test, mm -hmm. um, and doing a variety of things. And I, I would, it's probably worthwhile having it in there to to emphasize that that we are or that we are looking at these things and will continue to do so as opportunities come along. Yeah, ideas that's, come up. I mean, that's something that's routine. I think what uh, I think what I'd need to pull out of this from from you eventually is whether you want to set residency policies. Mm -hmm. Typically, that's been something that's uh, either bargained or through ad admin regulation. If that's something you feel strongly about, we'll certainly take your direction on on that. But that's that being called out specifically um, uh, uh, would. I think just warrant some discussion before we move too far. Is it something that can be left in as part of the vision, or yeah, you're it's, saying it's in terms consideration of, the board, of for consideration of that? Yeah, yeah, and then get down to brass tacks and and yeah, because obvi obviously residency has a greater there's there's more implications than just the the breadth of applicant pool, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? That that can start to affect operations, yeah. right? If people are supposed to be responding to emergencies and they're 90 miles away or 60 miles away or 20 miles, all that makes a difference. And those are just some of the nuances I'd want to have a discussion about. And then sure. wherever you're comfortable with, we could we could work on the, the policy side of that. So just working down the list here. So for number six, I'm hearing that maybe the, the strategic plan item is looking at that residency, considering the residency requirement for or public maybe, safety. Maybe even a little more general than that, the ensuring that public safety applicant pools are diverse through new approaches to me is the most important part of that mm -hmm. item. I don't know how everybody else feels about that. And the expanded residency allowances is just one potential action, means. Potential means. means so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. So this may end up in the people section of the strategic plan, just mm -hmm. as an FYI. Um, and then maybe staff can consider how to make it more action specific, because um, we, at the end of the day, you kind of want to be able to check it off a list, hopefully. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and then, 20 and 26, we were saying we're kind of tied enough to the mm -hmm. Nest Fun Lab. Okay. And so then 14 was the nursing program. And so I was hearing support for that. 
and phase, phase one. one support. Okay, so number 14, phase one. And so then I think the only one that we hadn't discussed was 30. I kind of assumed that was something we had already signed off on. Yeah, oh, there, yeah, the, the senior center. Again, I go back to saying that I think our community involves per persons of all ages and we can't forget the seniors because we have an aging population. and We've been talking about updating the senior center for a long time. So I think it's very important that we get, get moving on that. So that's already in process or? Uh, the exterior work is uh, in progress, at least the, the planning for that. The interior piece has a limited budget for. We have about three and a half million budgeted in our CIP. I think the master plan itself, Dreaming Big, called for about, I don't know, 14 million, 15 mm -hmm. million. That's probably not going to be realistic uh, unless it's a top priority and it's going to take a lot of resources from other <laughs> initiatives. But um, it's important that we execute, we find that right yeah. that right mm -hmm. level to execute at. So that, that's our goal. Um, we've already set aside some funds. Might need to bump that up a little, but we're, we're getting close. So, I mean, is it possible to reward this a little bit? Because the, the, the letter of the law, so to speak, is that it says, and execute on the facility master plan recommendations. Well, first of all, we can't get that done in five years itself, right? And then also if it's 14, 15 million dollars, I mean, maybe it's that second part of it could be just rewarded a little bit to um, continuing progress on the something like that. Yeah. 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 I wouldn't want it to drop out of yeah, our current exactly. CIP I, like I, if like we I don't want include it, to be, yeah, it in our short term. Right, but I, yeah, I agree. I don't think we can execute the entire thing in five years. Right. And right. at least to me, it's not of that level. I'm sure we could if we prioritized it, right? right? But I mean, there are a lot of things in our CIP, which I kind of viewed this as one that are not being discussed in our strategic plan mm -hmm. conversations, but I don't know. I mean, is it necessary to, that this be in there to kind I, of I don't, um I, I don't think it hurts. It, it's a major project that's going to require significant resources. Um, so I, I certainly don't think it hurts to be in there. Um, okay. Uh, I think we just need to probably word it in a way that, you know, make sure that um, the, the public expectation that we're setting is not unrealistic, that, that we can't necessarily achieve the $15 million vision, but we can certainly make uh, some comprehensive improvements that mm -hmm. will enhance that facility. So why don't we put number 30 on phase one, but maybe we'll work with staff to further refine that. And then Harrison, why don't you put number six on there just as a, a note, um, with a note that we will probably shift it to people. And so I, I think we're wrapped up then on. Can, can I throw just one on more? On this segment? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I just could throw out like a really one that's easy that would not, well, that would be a little bit of staff time, but not a lot is number 18. Um, it's annually hold three elected official listening posts per city council district. And in terms of a, of a very doable goal, yeah. um, that you know, would, would, would require some because we have to have some city staffing for, you know, to make sure that the meetings are open and accessible and stuff. But, yeah. but either in phase one or phase two, depending how we want to work into that. But I think that's one that was a, is a good opportunity for a council to step up and say, you yeah. know, and some stuff, city staff, right. we're gonna, you know, put some of our, you know. Right, it, well, it exists in the past. That <laughs> was kind of, I had initiated this, this one and the language changed a little bit. I had described it as a town hall rather than a listening post. I don't know if, um, for, meaning that uh, it would be something there where there would be uh, representation by the council as well as city staff so that you know, there would be an opportunity for questions related to a broader, a broader range um, could, be, could be raised and addressed at the meeting. I will say we've already had two um, listing posts this year, uh -huh. so we'll have one more. I think that the nice thing about the listening post is because that is smaller and just it's more conversational. The one that uh, uh, Councilor Burgess and I did earlier this year was it was a really was it was a good experience. Like uh -huh. it, 
Um, so I mean, I, I kind of you know I, I like that model that we had. So I just I thought that'd be something we could throw throw into there. Something we can we can we can do like when we check that box and. Well, I, I, yeah, I agree, cool. Councillor Harmson, that it's that it's important and used to be a regular thing that we as a council did. We just planned for them on a quarterly basis, and staff requirement time was pretty much Kelly or the city clerk uh, finding a location and and posting. Uh, uh, information about it. So I didn't believe that it went to the level of putting it actually in the strategic plan. It's just oh. something that we as the councilors should, should we plan do to do. Too, but, but does that, I mean, uh, I know I've been on the council a long time, so I should know whether that's really strategic plan or just plan and part of our duties as a council member. I, I don't know what other folks' opinion is. Yeah, we've been doing them as long as I've been on councils, and but, yeah. they haven't been in the strategic plan. Right. Yeah. Uh, With COVID, it kind of fell by the wayside, unfortunately. But yeah. I, I, I don't think it belongs in a strategic this. plan, but that's just me. But it, it is important. It is important. I just thought yeah. that was some I agree. I think the other thing is the um, items 9, 10, and 11. I don't know how they, those all basically just deal with the facility and personnel needs for the police and fire departments. Um, they have very actionable things, but to me, the common thread was you know, as the city grows, are we, are we, you know, and as we try and shift some of the policing into, you know, civilian response and some of those kinds of things, um, I don't know, do we want to just deal with it outside of a strategic plan? But I think that's something that, you know, in terms of like the five-year outlook, you know, we've got some decisions to make for like, do we build a new fire station? Do, you know, do we look at the amount of firefighters we have? Do we look at the staffing levels in our police department and, you know, in our, you know, in those kinds of things, it's not really um, exciting, but I mean, it seems like that's something that, either, whether it's in a strategic plan or not, just I felt it was worth a mention that that needs to be on our. I think we're gonna have to talk about those. Right. Um, but I don't know that it belongs in the, I understand it'll be a financial item, um, but I, I don't know. I don't, I didn't see it as being a okay. major here. There's mention in the resource section on most of those as well. Okay. Broaden that out if need be. I'm done, I promise. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me. All right, so now we're gonna shift over to the resources section. Um, and actually I'm gonna ask uh, Jeff and or Rachel or who, whoever else yeah, might be appropriate I, to kind of walk us through um, each sure. of the three <laughs> sub areas here. Yeah, so we're starting on page 30, and um, staff put together um, this with the understanding that we're probably gonna have to add to this section once the plan is starting to, to, to come together because each of your individual items might, might impact the, the resources that, that we need. Um, but as you look at the, the facilities uh, side of things, uh, facilities, equipment, and technology, I think you'll see kind of heavy emphasis on um, just a, a more comprehensive facilities plan. We have an, a number of facility projects in our CIP. Uh, you mentioned the senior center. We have uh, rec center updates, city park pool. We have landfill, uh, wastewater. We've got a lot of a lot of projects in the works. Equipment building is in there too. Um, but we really need to continue to stay focused and to, to to implement that. Probably the biggest thing that we need to start looking at is this 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 building here as both police and fire. Um, are, are are really cramped and and that can impact operations long term. So, really looking at um, city hall and and this kind of public safety headquarters building uh, and refreshing uh, space needs study and beginning to look at what alternatives can be. Um, part of that is going to um, uh, part of this plan then also looks at um, our uh, vehicles and, and transition to an electric fleet. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've been doing that uh, as opportunities come up with buses and, and other vehicles. Um, the Climate Action Team and Public Works Department are working on a broader electric uh, implementation plan for vehicles. Uh, as we know, uh, those early in on, on electric vehicles, particularly when you get into the heavier equipment like buses or street sweepers and things like that, you're probably gonna be paying a pretty good premium for those uh, first out of the market. So those are some of the things early on. Um, 
as we look uh, uh, towards the phase two action steps that are uh, listed, uh, you see some um, focus on smart city initiatives and, and really trying to actionize our, a lot of the data that we have here uh, at the city uh, in a way that's both helpful for operations but also that the public can take advantage of and, and utilize. Uh, so those are some of the highlights for the facilities, equipment, and technology section. Again, I think the biggest thing is preparing for those very significant facility needs, uh, particularly in those areas where we're operating in facilities that were really built in the 60s or 70s uh, when our population was quite a bit different um, and just thinking that we need to be planning for the next, next generation of employees and service delivery. Uh, the big thing with that is it is resource intensive, both from a staff standpoint, um, but also financially. Obviously, we're talking about buildings that uh, could cost anywhere from five million on the low end to twenty to thirty million, depending on what we're we're building. So the financial planning is is big in that as well. On the uh, people side, um, maybe I'll maybe I'll yep. stop you here and just. Uh, see, with respect to facilities, equipment, and technology, I mean, uh, <coughs> we have uh, the vision, um, the strategies, and then some of the action uh, st steps that Jeff covered. Was there, there any council feedback that on um, what's being proposed? What strikes me in looking at this is that the um, addressing overlaps and gaps in city programs and services organization-wide and identifying opportunities for improved coordination, that takes a lot of time and energy to step back and do that. It also seems necessary in order to undertake, for example, city hall redesign. You know, where are people going to be and who's in what department and what is the overall organizational structure? So I, I, I don't know if that process can happen you know, sort of sooner or be integrated throughout, but it seems to me that that, um, yeah. lots of other things benefit from that analysis, sure. but I also understand it's very resource intensive. Yeah. Good point. I mean, I'm very happy to see the, uh, the, the focus on climate uh, and, and sort of Moving into the city of the future, or where, where we are, where we'd like to be with with building with both the, the way buildings are built and um, and the and the vehicles that we're using. That's so. I'm not exactly sure how to phrase this, but how in thinking about like the the city hall and public safety headquarters space, you know that that particular action item, would you feel like you're kind of running to catch up? I mean, is this, is this particular action item, is this something that perhaps should have been started several, how, how urgent is this, I, I guess, is this most short? I mean, I, I, you and I have talked about it, and I know that, you know, the facilities themselves, I mean, they're, they're outgrowing the, the, yeah. the departments are outgrowing the building and the building is older. But I'm just wondering, like, at w how fast do you need to move to be able to not make this incredibly painful living in this well, space? Yeah. Um, most of City Hall is fully, is fully occupied. I mean, we've used, uh, we've, we've converted file rooms to offices and, and closets to offices. Um, so it, it's pretty full. The police uh, side as well, um, it's, it's difficult for us to bring in new people, even civilians or officers, just because we don't have the, 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 you know, the right space. There's very few spaces in which you could hold uh, large meetings. This room is about, about it um, that we have for, for that capability. So there's some impact to operations. The fire side, definitely there's an impact to operations. It's just an older model uh, station without modern amenities, and it's not laid out as efficiently as a new station would be. So um, the, 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 I guess the short answer is we're operating just fine out of there now. Um, and we probably will operate just fine. It's not ideal, but it's also not something that we want to wait a decade to address. Right, and so 
the planning is that first step um, in really trying to understand what those needs are, what's that square footage that we need, how can this space be reconfigured to accommodate, um, uh, likely have to move some operations off-site as we grow because we're in a constrained location. So it's, it's studying those issues and then coming back and, and painting a picture and pushing forward from there. So I see this as a is an item that does not get completed in this five-year plan, but I, I like it to be in here so that we can start that planning process intentionally and really start to focus on the financial side of things so that um, we don't show up with this urgent need in a decade and not have any money and any kind of thoughts on what we're gonna be doing. Sort of like Laura says, the sooner this planning and work can get done makes sense because then you can actually know what it is that you need to work towards All right. Uh, okay. Comments. It seems like generally you're, there's comfort with what's been presented there. So why don't we shift gears to people? Yeah. So on the on the people side, um, you know, clearly we have um, a lot of areas. I think in the environmental scan, if you can think back to that at the beginning of this process, I talked to you a lot about just staff being at capacity in a number of different areas, um, and and. That's something we're going to continue to have to be mindful of, uh, really making sure that those core services remain staffed at the appropriate level as our community grows. Um, we're going to have to, certainly going to have to work on that in this five year strategic plan period. But beyond that, a lot of what this focuses on, this document focuses on, is just recognizing that workplace expectations are changing and we can't fall behind on that curve. So we have to look at um, our. Um, our compensation structure, we're probably going to have to do comprehensive benefit reviews to make sure that um, our benefits are in line with, with modern expectations uh, for employees. Um, uh, and then uh, I think more of an internal function for us is just making sure that uh, uh, we're communicating as well as we can internally and that we're taking advantage of opportunities for departments to work together and, and really being as efficient as we can with, uh, uh, with our staffing and resources. So there's a lot, of, a lot of specific things listed here. I can uh, answer questions on those, but that's what this focuses on is making sure we have enough staff to carry out our core services and then making sure that we're still viewed as, as an employer of you know, top choice and that, our, th that we can attract and retain uh, great talent. I think in the strategies um, and on the bottom of the phase one action steps, it talks about uh, diversity. Um, and, and so that is something that I think uh, is Iowa City, and I think it should be reflected in our city hall. Do you have, um, with uh, thinking of it as um, you know, through the personnel and the people who comprise city staff, do you have sort of like a, a, a sub-strategic plan where, where, um, where the team members are looking to like what as our own institution, as our own organization, not carrying out city, but more like on the personnel side, you know, like the heads of departments saying, okay, so here's what we want to do for team members or as a department, we, you know, does that happen as well? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. Um, department directors will share their thoughts r routinely with with us in the city manager's office, um, and really through the budget process is when we have the discussions about staffing needs. That's when it's the most focused discussions, and and so we'll get, um, you know, we'll usually get the department request through the budget process on what they feel like they they need for, <coughs> for staffing, and they're they're excellent about being realistic, so they're not shooting for the moon or that ideal situation, but they're good at saying this is a need that needs to be addressed before services start to see it, you know, see, you see an impact in service delivery levels. 
And staff has an opportunity to come and speak to city manager staff. Um, I forget the name of it. It's yeah, we do an annual program where we meet with, with the frontline staff uh, throughout the summer. So it's about <coughs> you know, 25, 30 meetings. And, and that's a good opportunity for us to hear directly from uh, those frontline employees on what they feel the needs are. And, and then we can kind of compare that to with what the, the department uh, director and supervisor's perspectives are. And they mostly align in terms of what those needs are. All right, so it's feeling like people are generally comfortable with this as well. Mm -hmm. um, so then we'll move over to financial. Yeah, on the financial side, a couple things that I would point out, um, really focusing on um, the health of our various funds. So we call out our enterprise funds, which would mostly you think of as our utility accounts or parking, transit, uh, making sure that uh, they're healthy, they're stable that they have reserves. Uh, we've, we saw the importance of having reserves during COVID, um, and so making sure we don't let those uh, slip away. And then, of course, from the consumer standpoint, we don't want to be in a situation where we have to do large spikes. You know, And we've done a very good job. I think the council's done a good job where you haven't really had to consider a 10 or 15 percent water hike, uh, water rate hike or sewer, and that's really that careful stewardship and making sure that, that um, those, those fund balances uh, are good and that we're, we're generating a, a, a good um, surplus every year. Um, same goes for the, the general fund. There's some commentary here about maintaining bond rating, maintaining uh, emergency fund balances and, fi and, and facility reserve funds. Again, that's all just careful planning for, for the future. I think the biggest piece there is that facility reserve fund. Um, uh, I, think, I, I think in order for us to carry out our facility needs, we're gonna have to have a substantial amount of, of cash on hand, and we can't rely on, on referendums and borrowing for some of the types of buildings that, that we're looking at, right? Um, I always tell folks it's, it's very hard to get 60% voter support for an equipment maintenance building because it's not something that people see and they, they, they touch. Um, it's different for like an elementary school or a rec center where they can see themselves experiencing those types. But a lot of our facility needs um, will be in that category where they would be very hard to go to a referendum and get those votes. So that, uh, that building of the facility reserve fund, I think is gonna continue to be a critical strategy for us. Um, we do talk in here about um, putting more dedicated resources to grant management um, and, and uh, working on the, on the state and federal levels to ensure that we're getting, uh, uh, we're competing for as many grants as possible. We largely do that with existing staff capacity right now. And, uh, that's hard. It's, it's becoming harder and harder to, to step away from operations and pursue those. So really looking at a dedicated individual or um, contractor that would be able to help us with that. That would be a short term objective for us. And then uh, on the longer on the longer uh, end of things, uh, I do mention local option sales tax. Uh, just kind of looking ahead at what you have in the strategic plan and some of your more ambitious goals. Uh, uh, Councillor Weiner talked about child care and we've talked about affordable housing, we've talked about infrastructure, transit service. There's a lot of high dollar uh, um, items that, uh, that, that could be considered for, for local option sales tax. We had put that conversation a little bit on the back burner because of the ARPA funds and our focus to want to really execute on, on those ARPA funds first, but it's something I think the council should, should keep in mind long term. Any feedback on the financial section? And then I think I, I think the idea of having someone who's really dedicated to grant writing is, a, is an excellent idea because it's a specific skill. And if you have someone who really knows their way around it, you have a, a you know taught working with department heads and others. I think there's a much uh, there's a high uh, high chance of success. Mm -hmm. All right, great. All right, so we're uh, close to wrapping up here. Um, Harrison, I'll have you maybe just pull the PowerPoint up. Nice work, everyone. 
Um, so if you want to, um, so I also wanted to have as we're building out your plan, just a quick uh, conversation about how you would envision tracking your progress with respect to the plan um, once it's adopted. <coughs> Something you want to look at quarterly, um, twice a year, annually. I think some of it has to do with what, um, well, projects, we'll look at those individually um, as they're, you know, coming up. But if we're talking about looking at the entire plan, certainly I would say we could look at it annually just to kind of get an update on what's happened um, or just for a presentation from staff on where they are. But as projects come up, we're, we're going to be a little bit involved in that. So I guess I would say annually where we discuss it as a council um, and then as projects come up, we're going to naturally be um, talking about those in work session. I think there could be some value as well as kind of doing like a crosswalk when we're doing discussions of budget um, to call out and say, remember, this is something that was in phase one of our strategic plan, just because, you know, as it's taken us two sessions just to get through and winnow down. So I think it will be very useful to have that. I, I, I definitely like the annual. I'm the type of person who thinks of repetition as being incredibly helpful. I know that that takes up more time, but maybe the potential of doing it biannual, or not biannual, like twice a year, um, just so that it's more in mind, because again, I think that probably the <laughs> one of the things that I remember from from the f facilitation, as well as some you know comments that um, conversation that we've had with with Jeff, is in order to get this work done, we have to be incredibly focused and we have to be actually fairly disciplined. And so I think actually remembering and keeping top of mind what those strategic action items are and what we want them to be makes sense. So annually is fine. I just, I definitely want maybe reminders in there about if we're talking about budget, this is tagged as part of our phase one or this is phase two. This is not on our strategic plan, <laughs> things like that, just to help us have some guardrails as far as, as we move forward through funding these things and sort of prioritizing, so. I have a quick question. Will we be, because being new on the council and this being a bigger process because we're going from three to five years, but do we normally revisit and update the strategic plan every year, every two years? What sort of, I mean, what are we already going to be meeting and then would, are you talking about something in addition to that? Uh, so, so with the two-year plan, really the council set it at the beginning and then staff, we started off doing quarterly reports and over the last couple of years that slipped to probably twice a year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, with the, with the five-year, when we had the discussion about moving to five-year, I think the council all recognized that it's probably something that we can't just let sit for five years. So I don't know exactly what that time is. Maybe it's at the time of an annual report where you have a dedicated check-in. Um, but I do think a couple of years into this, you should expect that some priorities will shift, uh, right? We'll, we'll have something big come up, opportunities, challenges that may need to work its way into this plan to keep it fresh and current. So. Um, I, I think it's very healthy to do that after an election and you get new council members seated, mm -hmm. but you may want to do it again annually with your, with an annual report if that's what you want. Uh, the, the reason I ask was just like when we talk about these updates, like uh, somebody had mentioned doing it every, you know, it's part of the budget cycle mm -hmm. process as an update, which is usually in the spring, um, those early winter, maybe late winter, early spring, right? So. Um, so if we were to do it more than once a year, maybe the six months after that, like separated, mm -hmm. it was just the kind of way I was thinking. So I think having this, it, just the annual review, right before our typical question in normally is August, where you know what are our priorities? I think that would be a good time to do this annually, and then along with the budget. You know, I think staff is going to be pointing out and pulling out these are the things that were discussed. So I think that would be a good plan. 
Yeah, just as far as the format, I've always appreciated in the budget book that we get, there's like the little short introductive narrative sections that always have identified what stri strategic priorities, you know, and I think, I think with this format, not just for the action items, but kind of the way that it's framed, we'll be able to maybe make clearer connections. And so I hope, I look forward to seeing what that looks like in the budget. Mm -hmm. And then also just if there's on a, you know, project by project basis, anytime something is on our agenda that is an action item, I would hope that that will be called out and we can kind of honor that um, in the moment as well. So I'm hearing perhaps twice a year in August and as part of the budget process that there'd be kind of conscious check-ins. Um, at that time, would you want any sort of written like update with respect to specific action items or is that just more of a discussion for you? The annual? Is that what you're asking? Um, either of the, either the annual or the budget. I think to see progress, we would want something written. Yeah. You know, I don't know that it needs to be anything super complex, but at least as we're framing the sort of phase one, phase two action items, I would imagine we would want to mm -hmm. assess that list. <coughs> okay. And I recall it was really helpful um, with with the whole the, our 16 items or whatever it is under Black, Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter to have that um, that graphic that that allowed us to see where we were in the process yeah. mm -hmm. for different items. I agree. I'm I'm kind of a black and white person. I like I like to see it actually in front of me that Good this job. is where we are. This is where we need to go yet. And, uh, I like that idea. Great. Okay. Um, so in terms of our tasks yet to be done, we'll finalize the edits that we we had here today. We'll, we'll bounce back with staff um, and try and identify some of those target years and champions. Um, we're gonna add uh, so a little bit more detail in a couple of sections. I'm curious if you had to assign a number at this point with respect to, like, do you think we're 95% of the way there? You know, what, what percentage would you assign in terms of how comfortable you're feeling with, uh, if we were to incorporate the edits that you've, you've yeah. suggested today? I think we're really close. Yeah. I'm not going like, to assign a number, but I think basically we've, you have facilitated us doing the work, um, and and I can't wait to see what the finished product looks like. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I'd say 90, 95 to 98. It's just a matter of putting it together, and there might be just little. Sometimes that five percent takes a little longer than you think. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's like it's like moving, and you think mm. you packed everything up, and then you look yeah. around. <laughs> All right. Um, so we had a few items that um, we were intending to put in here, one being an alignment crosswalk, which means that for each of your values, we'd take your action steps and sort of show how it's connecting to your values. And then also we were gonna uh, show if it was connecting to the all together plan and or envision East Central Iowa. Um, Cause I know you guys mentioned that connectivity was important. Um, we were gonna put the action steps by fiscal year. I don't know. I'm sensing that maybe you guys, phase one and phase two was enough. <laughs> so <Yeah>. maybe <laughs> we don't need to do that. Um, so we might eliminate that. There were a few items that we had as, we were gonna put in as consultant notes. Um, that if, I mean, the cool thing about the work that you've done is that every year, you know, you're, you do it and you're building on the previous year, building on the previous year with respect to the strategic plan. So for us, if, if we were thinking about what we would give as recommendations as to how to get it to the next level, um, we would suggest perhaps a decision-making framework for when items come up that are not in the plan that you have to address as a council to make sure that you're not, you know, it's so easy to, di to get diverted off in a new direction and kind of forget all this stuff that you had uh, agreed to previously and I said is really important in recognizing that time and staff capacity is somewhat limited. So we would encourage you to consider developing something like that. Um, we had talked about metrics early on and uh, the more we looked at the types of action items you were most interested in, 
um, which really have a fundamental community impact. I mean, we think the best advice we would give you is to think about community-wide metrics in a dashboard um, that you know are really looking at the community overall and um, what those markers are that you think you want to see, um, whether it's poverty levels or um, income levels or um, that you think would be signs that your um, climate climate markers that you're kind of hitting not just the city but through the city and its work with its partners hmm. are kind of taking the whole community as a whole we think that might be more valuable so we kind of stepped back from the metrics in here and then we would recommend that kind of when you got to the phase one when you're kind of wrapping that up um, then it might make sense to do a facilitated process again. Um, hopefully the, the vision and the strategies are good. Um, and so it's really about just, you know, what have we completed, what's still on the list and what new has popped up and how do we prioritize those things? So I don't know that we need to be nearly as involved as what we went through here, but that would be our suggestion, so. Great. And then we just had our last little slide here, which is, you know, nobody wants the plan that's gonna sit on a shelf, right? That's, that's not what we wanna do. On the other hand, I think to think of plans as these absolute fixed things that never change is unrealistic as well. And so you wanna to adhere to it, but your environment is gonna change and there's always gonna to need to be some adaptation as you, as you flow through it and obviously the last few years have been a classic example of that with with COVID and how that threw a wrench and, and a lot of things so and uh with that if, any other feedback you want to give us before we close out here today I, I was having one thought and it was kind of triggered by the well well-being um category and that was uh the, the, this notion of well-being as it pertains and in a way your community metrics, maybe we're beginning to point in this direction of some of the ways in which well-being, you know, what, what's the state of well-being of our, of, of our natural systems um, in which we live? I mean, there, there's always this, in a way that the strategic plans seem to be creating a reality that was distinct from the natural world around us, which is really the foundation of well-being, I would say. So I, I be, and that's where I was kind of hoping to see once again the whole, the whole thing together, and maybe it's in there, but um, you know, we have climate action as a, you know, one of our, what is it, you know, main values that we're, we're, we're aware of and cognizant of, um, but I, I just began, I've begun to appreciate how climate action itself is in, per, in some ways perhaps a limited framework in which to understand the well-being of the natural world in which we live. So um, anyway, that's, that's just something I was beginning to feel that our, our plans seem to be very human-centric and not capturing this, this broader sense in, of the world in which we live, which is especially with climate change, but you know, it's, it's uh, biodiversity, it's water quality, it's the condition of our soils and so forth that are really the long-term, you know, in terms of our long-term resiliency and well-being, that's, that's important to consider. And we did hear some of that feedback at our last session, and I know we tweaked some of that vision language to incorporate the broader ecosystem. Um, and the health of that ecosystem. So that'll be something you'll be able to review yeah, when we good. share it back with you. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. It's been yes. delightful working very much. with you. Thank you. All right. It is uh, almost 445 counselors. I think what we'll do is take a 10 minute break and come back at uh, 455. And when we return, if I can, I'll just ask that the University of Iowa uh, students come and give their updates USG. And then after that, we'll go into the presentation of the inclusive economic, economic development plan for Johnson County. Does that sound good? All right, we'll be back in 10 minutes. It is now 4.55 and we're gonna continue in our work session on September 20th, 2022. And we're gonna invite 
University of Iowa Student Government, USG, with updates at this time. Welcome. Hi, Council. Uh, so Ellie couldn't make it to this session, so we would like to request uh, to give our announcements during public comment. Great, and that'll be fine. Thank you. Yep. You just have to keep it under three minutes. <laughs> All right, we're gonna move on to a presentation of the Inclusive Economic Plan, uh, econ Economic Development Plan for Johnson County. And welcome, yes. Uh, thank you. It's great to see everybody here today. Thank you, Council. Um, so I'm very excited today to uh, present to you this final draft. I like to say everything is a draft, so I'm just putting that out there again, uh, of our inclusive economic development plan. And this has been about a year in um, production, I guess, would be a good way of putting it. And mouse, sorry, not a touchpad, it's a mouse. Ooh, okay. I'll do this, how about that? Nope, I won't do that. I'll do this, okay. Technical difficulties, here we go. So just gonna give you some, um, you know, who we are, what we've been doing, what we've heard, and findings and recommendations. I know everybody is really eager to hear that, but we also want to get some context as to what we've been doing. So, V. Fixmore Rise, uh, CEO and founder of Astig Planning, and I'm also joined here by my colleague, Azmita Podol, um, who's been instrumental in putting this together. We have a lot of partners. Uh, you can see them here. We've also got a lot of uh, focus group uh, coordinators that have done incredible work. So I just want to say thank you to all of our sponsors, all of everybody who has been involved so far. So an inclusive economic development plan in Johnson County. is a We like to think of it as a collaboration between everybody that we've been working with um, that focuses specifically on underestimated businesses in Iowa City. That is the fundamental difference in this plan. And as you can see, we talk about uplifting um, the existing and ongoing plans. Certainly this isn't happening in a vacuum, so we want to make sure that we're talking and speaking across other municipal um, plans that are happening concurrently. Our process, this whole timeline, really, as I said, it's been about a year. So last November, um, I know we were kind of ideating and putting things together and researching, and then we kind of kicked things off. We had our surveys, our focus groups. We worked through the summer, did a strategic tuning session, and then have been working on putting together this plan ever since. And when I say that, I don't mean to say that, you know, our team has just been like, you know, massaging our keyboards. I mean that like we were, we were going back in, out into the communities and saying, hey, can you verify this? What do you think about these, you know, this collection of data? These are the findings that we're finding. Does this resonate with you? So it's not to say that we've just been, you know, typing <laughs> amongst ourselves these past few months, but have really been trying to verify things. So who did we hear from? Um, this is just for the survey. We had about 105 total respondents, and I just want to say briefly that we are talking about underestimated community uh, business owners. So those are folks that are actually really hard to get a hold of. You can't just send an online survey and they take it, right? So we had to do door knocking. We did translations. We had translators walk with us to businesses. We went multiple times. We went at different times. <laughs> Uh, we went to every city council in the county and asked them if they would help us identify these business owners. So these 105 respondents are like gold to us. <laughs> um, and so it's not to take it lightly. And you can see there we had about um, 63 existing owners, 17 emerging businesses, and then we had 24 business support institutions. And those support institutions are obviously like our local governments, but also um, other nonprofits that work in this area, and then uh, lenders and funders. I think it's really key that process matters. And so throughout this plan, we continually asked ourselves, are we being accessible? Are we being inclusive? And so in order to do that, our surveys, our conversations, our focus groups, we asked open-ended questions. We let people write things in. And that makes a real difference. And I think not only when they're taking the survey, but then as you can see the results. We had 25 different races that were identified, 29 different ethnicities that were identified. You're just not gonna see that kind of robust um, identification, and as we know, that matters. And so people feeling seen throughout this process was incredibly important to us. So that's, it, that's exciting to see. And you have multi-ethnic, you have Asian, you have Christian. I mean, just how people are identifying with their, with their groups, with their people. 
some of the outreach highlights, and here are some you know, fun pictures of our focus groups that we had. Um, we worked with you know, the diversity markets, we worked with Center for Worker Justice, and all different kinds of folks. And so it was great to have people come together and um, the Colectivo de Mujeres, uh, just to have these sessions in native languages with interpreters for those that are English speaking, I just invite every person to have that experience in their life. And as planners, we felt really fortunate to be able to do so. Um, it's very humbling, but it also creates a, a place of safety and bravery that people can be their more authentic selves, that their culture is seen and heard. So down to the data. <laughs> One thing that we really wanted to highlight are to dispel some mythology. So a lot of times people say, oh, immigrant-owned businesses or BIPOC-owned businesses, they don't have a lot of education. Not in this county. <laughs> That's not true. We can see that um, over 50% have at least undergraduate, and then you can even see spilling over into master's and PhD degrees. So just trying to de demystify some of this as well is really important. Please, please and then the rent, costs, the rent costs, the rent costs also when we look at some of the barriers in Johnson County, and this is something that we know across the county, uh, rent costs are one of those really huge barriers. So typically you don't wanna see anything over 20%. I think residential, we think 30%, right? I don't wanna be paying more than 30% for rent. But it's 20% for commercial, and you can see how staggering it is that over half of businesses are spending more than that. And so that's a real barrier. I also wanted to make sure that we're not just showing you data, that we're also providing you with some uh, language. You know, what, what inspired community businesses to, to want to thrive here? A lot of people talked about wanting to be with their children. It's very culturally accepted to have your children around you while you're at work and in other places. And um, also wanting to serve their people, you know, having the markets, having the sharing their culture with Johnson County residents. Um, and building that generational wealth, building that financial literacy. I had so many parents talk about passing on how to read a checkbook and, to their kids. Um, so that, that's some of those reasons right there. In terms of financial resources, this is where we see some of the differences. So uh, obviously emerging businesses are gonna have some you know, higher um, startup costs than maybe existing <coughs> businesses, but it matters <laughs> where they're looking for that, those resources. And um, we're also talking about financial literacy, we're talking about all these kinds of things that really buy into actual financial resources. And so ICAD is seen as that, the business partnership you'll see, um, but there is also some, some nuances. So for instance, the Multicultural Development Center of, I of Iowa's BIPOC Accelerator Program, they do offer re financial resources and yet, and it's BIPOC owned and led, and yet not many people know about it. So it's interesting to see where people are gravitating towards. Obviously it's a newer program. Um, you're looking to more established uh, organizations. Um, also good to know that people are using these resources when they need them. Here's again some of those langu the language that people were using. So um, some people having to sell their truck to make money for the business. I'll tell you time and time again, I heard that it is uh, for many cultures just culturally inappropriate to go into debt. There is just so, there's like a visceral, you can almost see people change their body when they talk about having to go take out a loan. They will do anything to not do that. And so um, there's some you know, financial literacy that needs to go into that, but also a real understanding of why it takes these businesses so long to get off the ground and what they're willing to do and sacrifice in order to make that happen. Uh, so you'll see a lot of gathering capital <laughs> of their own accord. But then you'll also see, on the flip side of that, a fear of actually going into those banks, going into the city, like into the city buildings or county buildings, uh, because they don't feel accepted. They're, they feel very intimidated. Um, and that could be the documents that they're looking at or the person that's literally in the desk in front of them, um, just feeling very inaccessible. So some of those resources that act as barriers, I think a lot of this was pretty well you know, guessed, but um, rent costs, as we saw, is, number, is, is huge. Access to money, clearly, um, and then the location. So the, the commercial rental space is, is certainly key. Um, but you also see things like you know, access to uh, childcare, um, things like legal services, accounting, those types of services that people just literally don't know where to go. Um, and so that becomes a barrier. Um, 
and, and language and things like that. So when we look on the other side and we start talking to our business support institutions, we ask them, well, are you, um, do you have these programs? And so people say, no, not only do we not have those programs, but the ones that we do, um, we can't really take that, inf we can't take that type of information in. So like banks lending information is not, is, it's just really hard to have any type of discernible demographic data attached to that. Um, there's some requirements, but they're very vague and they're very much so um, observational. And so that makes it hard to know where we are <laughs> if it, we're not collecting that data. Uh, but also a lot of these programs have only been around because of COVID. And so the real sense that people feel is that, no, they're, they're not around. These programs don't actually serve underestimated businesses. Um, and do they provide loans? So obviously if the programs aren't there, there's not gonna be loans, it's hard to track. One thing that really stood out to us too is that nobody's doing any surveying. Nobody even just has like, a. a when you're filling out this application, you know, identify any economic data or, um, or racial data or whatever that may be. Oftentimes this is sensitive and we understand that. It just makes it hard for us to do our job in the end in terms of who's being served and how. Um, where do people get information? That's incredibly <laughs> important. When we look at underestimated businesses and communities, we really look at people using word of mouth, friends and family, social media, and when you look at the flip side of institutions, it's like, where do they put that information out? Some of it is social media, but a lot of it is their websites, and people just don't go to those websites. And so what we are trying to show is there needs to be a shift, a shift away from just, well, we put this on our website, so it's good to go, and shifting towards, did you print it out and put it in the barbershop? Did you put it in the lavenderia? Like, did you go and actually get out into the community in ways that people interact with this? Because that is really the gap. And we kind of knew that, but now this really shows that that is absolutely the case. And one thing that is a little bit disheartening about it is that if things aren't being directly communicated, they're being communicated through word of mouth, and word of mouth can be misleading and can be you know, really um, hearsay. And so that was another thing that we heard a lot, was a real desire for that direct communication. Um, so language access is a really big issue. And you can see that, you know, do support institutions provide information in any other language? No, large part no. I think Iowa City actually does a pretty good job of doing it. But when you actually look at the languages that are being spoken in Johnson County, according to ACS data, it's Mandarin, French, and Spanish. And you only currently see some Spanish in most lending institutions, in most of these business support institutions. So, um, and also just wanna note that it's not that you just wanna have a document translated in another language. You need to have that like follow up person that can answer and read that and help that person in those ways, right? So we're not just talking about a one and done, we're really talking about like a dynamic interaction. So, but we can take small steps. Uh, one thing that was really important, I know, was trying to understand if people um, received relief for COVID impacts. And I will say this gets a little bit tricky because oftentimes, I'd say about 30% didn't know if they even qualified. And I, as a small business owner, understand why, okay? It was very confusing. If you didn't have an accountant, there was really no way to know. Um, and so most people just thought they didn't qualify. Um, I even thought I didn't qualify, to be honest. Um, so you have about a third of people that are saying that they did receive funding, you know, about 60% saying, no, they didn't. We even tried to say, if you didn't receive funding, why? And most people just said, I don't know. So maybe there wasn't any follow-up with them. Um, so there's that. And then we have some funding that was provided specifically for BIPOC uh, businesses that were impacted by COVID and that was through Better Together, and that was $50,000 um, for 33 BIPOC-owned businesses. I wanna characterize that briefly by saying $50,000 for 33 businesses, I mean, think it's, there's something, you know, and they were like $1,000 to $5,000. When you look at the millions of dollars that Iowa received for federal PPP funding, it, it just pales in comparison. So I know that there's certainly lessons learned from COVID, and this is certainly a, a space that could be expanded upon. 
So solutions and opportunities, and we definitely go into this more in the plan, um, the draft plan. So one-on-one -on -one mentorship was huge. When you have underestimated businesses, they're trying to navigate a sea of you know, finances and legal terms and things like that. So having a mentor that was like them, that has been through this, is a game changer because it's a hand-holding that can really only be done in that same way and somebody that has experienced those same barriers and workarounds. Um, so that one-on-one -on -one mentorship was seen as very crucial. Classes, affordable spaces, community grants, having a sense of community. So um, Colectivo de Mujeres de Negocios, they recently changed their name, so I'm still trying to learn it. But <laughs> what I love about that group is it started out as a support group for uh, Latinx women who wanted to open a business, right? And you can see how that is so needed because you're completely siloed. As you know, a business owner wanting to start off, you're just like, where do I go? How do I even navigate? So it's incredible to see that they knew they needed that community and they came together. And you'll see that in our recommendations. Um, so street vending opportunities came up a lot, and that is really cultural. Street vending around the world <laughs> is very different than it is in the United States. And um, it's not that street vendors don't want to follow the rules. They do. They just want to know what they are. And of course, they would appreciate a little bit more flexibility. <laughs> so, But they're very much so rule followers. I just want to make that clear. Um, low interest no loans, and we have some descriptors specifically for that. And then again, that consolidated information on permits in multiple languages. Like a lot of consolidated information would actually be really helpful to kind of get away from that word of mouth. And then access to the community commercial kitchen. That came up literally in every focus group um, that we talked with. What I wanted to touch on for a second was this equity perception. So we asked people in the survey, you know, to create equity and opportunity for all, I believe a greater portion of resources should go to those who are most in need. And you'll see there's a big swing to the right. And that is very heartening. It means that most people are like, yeah, I strongly agree with that. Whether you're an underestimated business owner or you're a support institution. So we're headed in the right direction, <laughs> uh, literally. Um, so that's good. And I think that that showcases the potentiality that we have with this plan. So what we heard in terms of barriers to be more specific, cost of rent, gaps in resource information, lack of access or perceived lack of access to financial banking systems, a hostile business support system environment, lack of access to childcare, short supply of business mentors, and missing those relationships with business support systems. If anybody has ever owned a small business or known anybody that's known, owned a small business, you know that that relationship to that banker, to that accountant, to that lawyer, is a lifeline. There may be questions that come up or a COVID relief that comes through and you need to be able to call somebody, like a human, not Wells Fargo. And quite frankly, many people just gravitate towards Chase Bank because it's just what's out there. It's the big banks, you know? So that um, can cause barriers. We did culminate a strategic doing session and thank you for those that were able to attend. I know you all can't be there at the same time. <laughs> Um, so we did have a lot of local um, government leaders, staff, business support institutions, lending institution, nonprofits, and of course, local vendors. And I have to say that sharing that space with those people in, the, in those four hours that we were together was just an incredible moment to have street vendors who were talking, who were like at the table with the city administrator, the mayors, um, and vice versa. That the questions that you know city council may have there's somebody there who can answer that <laughs> like very acutely and specifically um, and the aspirational quote which i really just appreciate is imagine a robust entrepreneurial community in johnson county that authentically welcomes and empowers underestimated business owners with a sense of belonging throughout all stages of business and idea development that wraparound is really what we're talking about we did come up with three Pathfinder projects, and I am thrilled to say that all three of them have moved forward and have been a success. And that is just very rare. <laughs> so we have a mobile food vendor portal, which Iowa City is a part of, along with Coralville and North Liberty. And so we're moving forward on trying to get these three cities plus Johnson County Public Health to have very clear guidelines and protocol and that they report back to that, that you can click on one and go to the other. Because oftentimes vendors are like, well, where do I go to get this information? So 
just trying to even make that clearer. The Johnson County um, Inclusive Business Education Series, they're actually kicking off at the end of October with um, a financial literacy for uh, Latinx community. And so they're having a couple of series of speakers uh, and I'm sure they'll be getting information out. So I, if you'd like to attend, <laughs> you're certainly welcome. And then the under, underestimated mentorship program is also moving forward. Um, MDC Iowa currently has a mentorship platform that they're trying to um, get support around and wrap around to provide to more people. And so that's BIPOC led and um, four. And so that feels like that's really moving forward as well. So um, I feel like if anybody's ever done strategic doing, that's pretty amazing. All three, way to go. Okay. Our recommendations. <laughs> So the number one recommendation that we have is creating neighborhood level multicultural business hubs. And the reason because it reduces a lot of those barriers. You're in your community, you can just walk or bike to it. You know those people, you have those experts, people who look like you talking your same language, who have professional background or at least can give you access to that professional knowledge that you seek. Um, and then we also have uh, you know, financial literacy programs that can happen there. Maybe there's already a commercial kitchen um, that people can use. But we really believe in what the model that is a bit more disaggregated and with, embedded within the communities. And that also is supported by the Better Together Project. And so that feels very authentic here. We have behind the scenes support and then we have public facing support. And um, I'm gonna go into some of these a little bit more. Um, the plan really goes into a lot of them very in depth, and I want to definitely watch my time here, so we have time for a lot of questions. Um, but a lot of changes in policies and procedures, internal work, and then bolstering the entities um, and organizations that are already doing the work, and then sort of externally providing those resources, but then also building the infrastructure is generally how we have this broken out. Um, I will just say that specifically for Iowa City, we did a very like general look at what were your ARPA goals so that we could kind of match some of this. And um, based on the public input that you all had received and staff recommendations, along with your strategic plan, uh, which you're redoing, but <laughs> 2020 to 2021 at least, um, it aligns with those as well. So when you look at the um, promote an inclusive and resilient economy through, throughout the city. So the recommendations that you had gotten from staff, these were the four that were provided back a year ago. And so we embedded that with ours. So the neighborhood level multicultural business chamber hubs is that physical space. And I just wanna note that when we say multicultural, because it's really easy, business chamber hubs, we don't wanna say that every, every chamber hub is multicultural. We're just saying that like, could be Latinx, could be Hispanic, could be Asian. Whatever it is, whatever is needed within that community, um, that's what it should be. So I just wanted to clarify that. But as you can see, it reduces those barriers. You already have that trust, a centralized um, information source. Um, and then you can have those mentorship programs and you know, increasing those direct access to federal and local funds. Because we see this not as a bypass from business support institutions, but literally itself its own business support institution. So it has direct access to those federal and state funds. And then access to the low or no cost commercial kitchen space. Um, this could also be a place where there's neighborhood level access to mobile vendor spaces as well. The second uh, recommendation was the Youth Entrepreneurial and Community Center Accelerator Programs. So we really felt like supporting those current BIPOC-led business support institutions that are already doing this is really where we could see this fitting in. And um, there, are, there are already current programs, there are future programs. There's a lot of opportunity for the businesses that are already, do, the organizations that are already doing this to do more. One thing that would be really helpful is to reduce duplicative professional service um, expenses across these support organizations. And really that's looking at you know, access to the accounting, customer service, insurance, liability providers. Not necessarily saying that the city fund that, but helps set up the system. Because these organizations, I mean, let's be real, we're talking about MDC Iowa, we're talking about Tracy John, we're talking about CWJ, we're talking about Mazahir. Like, they're just one or two people doing this. They don't have the bandwidth or the capacity to actually create the system. 
Um, and then helping assist with transparent and recurrent evaluations to help do what I just said, basically, because they don't have the capacity to help support those partnerships. We do feel that there is um, certain criteria, though, when we look at which institutions could receive the uh, fundings to, for current and future programs and things. This might be helpful, and it's certainly a starting point. This isn't the be-all, end-all, but this is one idea. So if you um, have just two criteria, which is that you have a proven record of established economic development, the number of years in service plus good standing with the city, and then two, you actually provide those services. So um, you do funding and lending programs or you host the economic development programs. We really wanna stress that these are the current organizations that we have been talking to, that we have been working with, but it is not limited to these organizations. We hope that we could get the opportunity to even broaden that even further. It's just through the work that we've been doing, this is who we've been communicating with. We don't know everybody. So our hope is that we get to know more people. Um, the startup and expansion grants, so create local government procedures for funding and loan programs. We found that there were specific things that kept coming up time and time and time again that were increasing the borrowing amount, creating more time before the first payment, and no interest in the first year. So whenever people were getting funding, they were like, well, how am I supposed to pay this first payment? I haven't even got two clients, you know? So it just, the turnaround time was too quick. The community navigator, um, we really see this as community networking and certainly could be a person um, or it could be a system. So improving those networks of support between those local governments and existing organizations. So that's accountability, transparent evaluation, and then supporting the evolution of those partnerships. And that could happen through streamlining that communication. That is to say that like these mentorship programs, getting all of this started and off the ground, we know it's gonna take a person, like it's, it's gonna take something to get there. It's not just gonna happen overnight. You know, We need to look at how do we create that system. So that's community networking. And then we also have behind the scenes recommendations. So that internal work, clear city permitting, um, county licensing, and then, of course, the more affordable commercial rental spaces through creative ordinances is potential. Um, the internal work, so recognizing and legitimizing multicultural planning perspectives. This black space manifesto is created by black uh, planning professionals, and it's clickable, so I definitely recommend checking it out. And then require anti-racism training that integrates reconciliation, healing, and learning. So a lot of times people feel like, oh, I'm gonna be doing this training and I'm gonna to have to check the box and I'm gonna to have to like do the worksheet. That's not what we're talking about. We're really talking about creating a culture of care that's centered on truth telling and reconciliation that addresses harm or trauma in safer, braver spaces. So it's, it's more transformative than just that. And we do have some recommendations in the plan. And then incorporating multicultural and multilingual design elements in office and public spaces. It's amazing how much of a difference it makes people feel when there's like multiple, like all the country flags or like welcome in multiple languages. I mean, these sound very silly, but they're actually really important um, and do generate a, at least a, an inkling of something else is different here. So the more affordable commercial rental spaces through those creative ordinances, um, you could look at adaptive reuse assessment uh, and, and, re and ordinances as well as uh, commercial overlay districts. So there's examples all over the country um, that could be utilized, but really looking at how do we revitalize and rehabilitate some of these vacant properties, especially post COVID or post COVID, but just where we're at in COVID. <laughs> There's uh, certainly opportunity there. And then the clearer city permitting and county licensing processes. So we've already started doing this with the Pathfinder project, but uh, really wanting to note that street vendors and mobile vendors really feel like it's a very confusing system and it's not in multiple languages um, at all. So there's um, some movement there. What we see as our next steps is continuing to support our Pathfinder projects that are wrapping up here in the in the foreseeable future, and then also offer to create specific action items and steps for cities and counties. Um, we already did kind of a high level ARPA funding mashing together, um, but we would love to get together more robust uh, forms of uh, recommendations after convening underestimated business owners, working with staff, saying here's the funding, this is what it could go through, 
you know, working through all of the details to actually come up with an actual proposal. So we feel as though we've done a lot of this initial work. We do have a lot of uh, connections and access to these um, inclusive, or I'm sorry, to these underestimated business owners. Not that we have to be the ones, but as was stated just, I don't know, maybe an hour ago, nobody wants a plan to sit on a shelf, and this plan is too important, so. It's important, yeah. Thank you. Amen. All right. I'm ready for some questions. Thank you. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> what do you think, Bruce? Well, you weren't paying all right, you council. You're looking at your computer all the time. I see you. We can ask questions at this point <clears throat> and give comments. And thank you for the presentation. Yeah. And I do recognize that some of the partners are here as well. So thanks for, uh, to you all for being here as well. Uh, v, is it, is it possible to um, categorize the types of businesses that you made contact with? Well, what um, kinds of services, in other words, you know, what sector of the economy are they sure. coming from? Yeah, I would say um, just off the top of my head, I mean, sure, we could do that in the focus groups. Our survey was anonymous, and uh, we did that to gain trust. I think that we're hopeful that we can follow up and have create more relationships. But um, I would have to say that probably what we heard from was more food service, construction type businesses. So retail, mm -hmm. yeah, that would probably be my guess on that. I mean, one one reason I'm, I was asking is, and I don't e I don't even know if, if it's possible to do this, but um, if there are a lot of large employers in Johnson County and, say, the city of Iowa City. Uh, would it be possible for the city of Iowa City to have, you know, incentives in place to, with its contracts, uh, to be able to provide, you know, to contract with, with some of the, the businesses, say, that you were meeting with, uh, where they had... Um, you know, certain advantages with respect to the bidding process. You know, I, I know that some cities have that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know San Francisco had it. They had local and minority and women-owned business preferences in their contract negotiations. So that seemed to me, um, I, you know, again, I don't know if that's possible, but yeah. having, you know, companies that can purchase your, your services, whatever they may happen to be, uh, seem to me one another option or mm -hmm. potential way of, of promoting these these businesses. Definitely, I believe the Quad Cities has done that with their construction uh -huh. contracts. So that's the the closest example that I know of. Okay. And um, I believe Redmond was really instrumental in that. So you probably would have some more information on exactly how to do that because mm -hmm. they did a study and then the study was able to back up that they could do it. So there is precedent for that, Good. at least in the construction. Good. Yeah, construction would be a great one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It, did you have any interaction with the university or any sense of, <clears throat> of how the university could be a part of this? Yes. So our, um, we reached out to the university throughout the entire process, and they did. Uh, they ha they are engaging us in the um, strategic doing session in particular, and so they have had a lot of interaction there. And I think there's always more possibility with the University of Iowa, and we certainly have their ear. So I think pulling them in would would not be difficult. Yep. This is a phenomenal and really thorough dive into this that just peels back layers and layers and that you didn't rest on the one layer and you're like, okay, what's going on underneath this is, is just tremendous and thank you for that. Um, I think we're gonna be in a much better position to move forward because of this work. Um, one of the questions that I had um, has to do with um, sort of having the, the business support, the multicultural business hubs. And you have, again, you said it's not limited to the specific um, organizations that you have. Um, but I'm kind of wondering, because they all have their primary, 
vision and purpose and mission as well. Um, do you feel that there's a pipeline for the the expertise and the mentorship and the support that is necessary? It seems to be such a crucial piece to helping um, you know these small business owners. Mm -hmm. go to the next level so that then they, I, I recognize success breeds success and mm -hmm. support breeds support. And so the very people who might be helped now may find themselves in a place where they're like, and now I want to help along. But I'm wondering from the outset, is this just sort of one of those things where it'll move kind of in a ripple effect and kind of build momentum or, um, I guess I'm just wondering about the sort of the ratio of expertise and those f people who have been there, done that, and mm -hmm. can help those who need that help. Mm -hmm. uh, do you feel like there's enough of that within the community or places where you might be able to seek out additional supports and maybe where's, where's the flexibility in that? Because yeah. that's the part that concerns me is, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, you need to have the expertise in the success in order to be able to provide that mentorship and that, or maybe it is like, we'll learn it together, as you said, with that group that, that came together. So anyway, if you can talk a little bit about Absolutely. that. Absolutely. No, it's a really great question because it's sort of this like chicken and egg, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. It's like, do we have uh, BIPOC lawyers in abundance? No, not really. Like, but how are we going to get there? Well, they have to be able to see themselves there. And we do have a few. And so I think that the answer to your question is really yes. I think that um, those resources, those people are in our community. They don't feel valued. They don't feel seen. And they don't feel like they can get a job working in a place where they can be their authentic selves. So not to speak for them. I mean, I feel like I can a little bit. But I think from what I've heard and seen, it's almost like everybody's waiting in the wings. Like this plan, definitely reaching out to folks, really you started to see just how many people were behind the people in front of you. And it, it I think, is really exemplified in the fact that we have so many organizations that are working in you know, multicultural development, really. I mean, you have Latinx population, you have Sudanese population, you have black population. I mean, that's pretty robust, and Chinese. Um, so we did, a, we did a pretty good job of outreach. My team knows, we talk about this all the time, we can always do better. We didn't reach everybody. In fact, there's a section in here on lessons learned. <laughs> I mean, we could have done a better outreach to the Asian community. Um, there's just only a staff of four, you know? So I think that lessons learned, absolutely, if we get more people involved, if we start rolling down this hill, we're gonna, we're gonna be a big boulder by the end. Like it's, it's definitely the time is how it feels. You brought up uh, some of the partners um, which Mayor Brotim just uh, alluded to, such as the Multicultural Development Center of Iowa, Center for Worker Justice of Eastern Iowa, mm -hmm. uh, just to name a few. And um, okay. what I do know is that a lot of people, myself included, get sent there. Or I, 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 I'll, you know, someone to call and say, how can I um, get assistance for whatever? And typically, those are two of the people that I send them to because uh, their scope has and their um, arm has been so broad to assist in people. So one of the, I think one of my questions is when this does um, continue to play out, how, because there's financial um, elements to it, um, there is a grant, you know, grants because there's agencies that get federal grants or that um, and there's also I'm blanking on the name of when people can become a part of a program um, if you're a minority owned business um, but there's programs out there mm -hmm. that people can be placed and so when you talk about the technical assistance is that a part of what um, could happen is matching them up with some of those resources that they may qualify yeah absolutely yeah, definitely. Um, obviously, I, get, I think I know what you're saying. So we're currently talking about ARPA funding, but there's funding beyond that. Is that like what you're Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. How do you maximize your, yes. you know, the, the funds that, because, um, 
there will never be enough yeah. to meet the needs, right? Correct. Um, and then the other uh, question, I'm curious to know how other communities or cities, uh, municipalities within the county have been receptive to uh, this uh, process. Um, it has varied. And I think that, you know, through this process, really wanting to honor that every city is different in Johnson County. And so, especially when you're talking about economic development and particularly focusing on underestimated community members, um, to be honest, I think there's a lot of education. I mean, I think that that was kind of one of the first things that we learned was, you know, um, what does that mean? What does underestimated mean? And, you know, what does BIPOC mean? And so, I think there's some education there that had to happen initially, which uh, I think probably made it a little bit harder to com to like communicate and to understand, you know, what what we're doing and what we're asking people to do. Which, when we went to cities, we asked them to help us basically. Like your leaders in your community, you may even be business owners. Do you know any people who are women or immigrants or anybody who started businesses? And I think the vast majority of towns have been like very curious, which is really all we're asking. And there were a few that were less curious. So, yeah, that's how. Thank you. Yeah. You started to touch on that, V, with the educational component, but what other challenges did you identify or can you kind of talk us through when we're thinking about some of these recommendations? Yeah, I don't think that there really is a sense of um, like diversity that is felt in some communities, and so there's not really a valuation of that. And so, I don't know how else to say that, <laughs> but I, I think that that's some of what we were feeling is that there's a homogeneity here that we are just not going to invest in something that we don't see or that we, you know, it's hard to value what you don't see or understand. And so I think education is like the first thing, but then also uh, wanting to make sure. Um, so my staff and myself are underestimated people. So like I also have to recognize that they're looking at us and we're looking at them. <laughs> and we're asking them mm -hmm. to really take a hard look at their community. And so that may just not be what people want to do. And I think we felt some of that, if I'm being honest. Interesting. But that vast majority, though, let me just really state, vast majority of Johnson County, very curious, very willing. In, in smaller towns that you just would not even anticipate that, very welcoming. And, yeah. and did you get the sense that that was the case or that there were some communities that are sort of in transition? They may not have thought about this very much before, but when they start mm -hmm. to think about it, they realize, hey, yeah, we do have people representing this group, that group, the other group, maybe we ought to be able to figure out a way to push them forward. There definitely was that. And then there was others. Like, so I think that there's a gradation. There's certainly people that are just not really, or town, they're just not there yet. They're just not there yet. And that's okay. There are towns that are absolutely going through transition and booming transition. And so um, very, and, and curious, like, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, so that's really heartening. And I think that, like I said, the vast majority of people were interested in what does this mean? What are you talking about? And I think a lot of times people are just like, well, what do you want? <laughs> and really all we were asking for was just access to, because we understand as underestimated people that like, it's, you know, who am I coming from Iowa City or, you know what I mean? Like, so I, we were just hoping to have some buy-in, some like, I'm gonna meet your friend you know, kind of thing. But yeah, I'd say absolutely. There are several towns that are going through a lot of transition in Johnson County. And so they very much so are curious, what does this mean? Yeah, great questions. Echoing everybody else's, thank you for, for doing this work. Um, also, could you just speak a little bit more about, you know, you'd said that, uh, as you correctly pointed out, nobody wants to create a plan and then see it collect dust on a shelf. Yeah. What do you see as the, you know, next next round of steps or next things for yourself or for, for partners on something? Yeah, absolutely. So we are going to every city in the county that would like to hear back about the plan. Um, and we did go to all of the cities, uh, pretty much almost all of them. And so our hope is that, so it doesn't sit on a plan, on a shelf, is that we get to return to this with 
the cities and the county and say, okay, now that we know these recommendations, now that we know this data, you know, where does this fit with your funding priorities, with your strategic plans? Like, how do we move forward? Because I think that um, what's really great is that there is a lot of momentum and interest, and particularly with ARPA funding, that there is this like, well, what do we do with it now that we have it? And I'm, we're hopeful that this plan can show like, well, there's internal work <laughs> that needs to be done, and also there's a lot of barriers that need to be re removed. And the multicultural, like chamber, neighborhood level hubs are um, what we, what the, the amalgamation of all the things that we heard really, um, that, that it could be a direct funnel for funding, that it could have all of the people that look like them, and you know, um, also those professional experts, they could walk there, you know, all of these things were incorporated really truly in that. There's obviously ordinances and there's like all other kinds of stuff, but that, that is a big one. And recognizing that there's lots of partners in that, particularly in a city like Iowa City, Coralville, North Liberty, there's nonprofits, there's community leaders. Um, and I see our team at this point, and again, I never wanna say that like we have to be the only one. Since we have been doing this work, we have, we're, we, we, we convene people. You know, we want, we know folks, and we like to know folks we don't know. <laughs> and we want to make sure that as many people as possible are together on this, because it is a game changer to have some funding like this come through our, our town and our county, and um, making sure that it's uplifting in ways that are helpful. So that's what our hope is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we really appreciate you being here today yeah. and presenting all of this information. Sound like there's been a lot of uh, work happening, a lot of work to continue, and um, we're just happy to be a part of uh, this process, uh, even at this level. So thanks Definitely. for what you do, and yeah. I'm sure we'll hear from you some more. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Before we move on, I do see... Um, I think we should be able to get through our agenda. We'll just trailblaze through. So clarification of agenda <laughs> items. So USG, get ready. <laughs> Didn't they say they wanted to come at the beginning? She's here now. Elizabeth She's is here. here. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll move on to information packet discussion for September 8th. Information packet, September 15th. And we're gonna welcome USG at this time to give us updates. All right, welcome. Hi, Council. All right, uh, to start off, um, we recently had our executives uh, go to the Board of Regents meeting uh, where they discussed mental health, basic student needs, and the way to incentivize uh, students to stay in Iowa. At this meeting, it was announced that $1 million uh, will be added to their budget recommendation for mental health services, and this will be divided amongst the other universities in Iowa. And then uh, voter registration, today is National Voter Registration Day, and the undergraduate student government has partnered with other campus partners to have a voting re uh, registration table event and to get more students registered for the November elections. And then uh, we just had the undergraduate student government uh, finishing our competitive fall nominations uh, process for senators. We had over 90 uh, candidates apply and a lot of qualified candidates. We ended up with 14 new senators who we welcome to USG and can't wait to see what they'll do. Um, additionally, the IMU is gonna be going through major renovations within the next few years. Um, 
So they're currently in the planning stages now um, following the project's approval. Um, it's estimated that it will cost around $81.1 million um, to make, to expand the IMU into both um, uh, Hubbard Park as well as based in the area that it is now. Um, if council would like to contribute uh, to the feedback of the project, um, now would be a really great time and we can share contacts. Additionally, um, programs that are based out of the IMU House Hotel, such as the Lease Gap program that we did this past year, will hopefully be moved um, and relocated to be hosted by private hotels in the Iowa City area. Um, and yeah, the IMU House Hotel will be shutting down, sadly. Uh, but finally, uh, we hope to still present the results of this year's renter guide, renter's guide um, at an upcoming session. Um, we had some really great results, um, like over way more than we had received in the past and a very diverse group of students um, that responded. So the analysis is gonna be really interesting, I can imagine, so yeah. Um, and this is also my last meeting. <laughs> and it has sincerely been an honor to get to work with you all. And I hope to continue to in the future um, with my own research, as well as just in general, being involved with the Iowa City community has been such an up uplifting experience. And it's tragic to leave early, but I'm, I'm excited to see like for future plans and stuff like that. So thank you for everything. Well, we certainly want to thank you. I think you've been with us since fall of 2020. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I think so, actually, yeah. Yes, <laughs> fall of 2020. So on behalf of the city of Iowa City, I want to present you with the Certificate of Appreciation uh, to Elizabeth for thoughtful contributions during the 2021 through 2022 year of service as the city council liaison and alternate liaison from the University of Iowa undergraduate student government USG and for demonstrating commitment to student participation on this 20th day of September 2022. Aww. So if you don't mind coming up here and getting this. Thank you. Really appreciate the USG and the uh, city connection here. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, with that, um, I think we'll save updates and all that stuff for the end of our formal meeting. So we will be adjourned until 6 p.m.